Hey, my name is Will O'Donnell, and I wanted to check out the Three Count Podcast. Do you want to get live with me? Do you really want to ride with me? I'm in the club, baby, grind on me. Welcome, everyone, to another great edition of the Three Count Podcast presents Now Entering, and I'm your host, Clifford Red Dog Miller, the man that leads you out that amount of call wrestling. And with this being season five, and we have, you know, 300 something episodes, I would just hope you say it with me, I am your Sherpa, because like your tribal chief, acknowledge me but like every good shirt but you gotta have someone who's been there done that and can do it more efficiently you can't that's why it's never about me it's about who's entering so who's entering the ring today well you can actually find this man as an emmy winning you know cameraman he is an actor currently and he is one of my good friends and talk to him well actually we haven't seen each other in almost a decade and this is kind of like our wrap up so you guys get to check this out he is the man the myth the legend the one that i like to call my best friend Will O'Donnell. <laughs> hey, everybody! Uh, you know, thanks for having me, Cliff. This is uh, this is wonderful. I mean, I, I've uh, I've been following your your pathway to your your dream uh, of what you've always wanted, what you've always talked about for years. And it's uh, it's so uh, it's just amazing to be part of your ring now. You know, just being being included and invited to join you on the show. You know what's funny, man? Because like I remember like always like watching wrestling like in in our in our unit like it, so for those who are not going to be caught up uh will and i actually met while we we're while i was in the air force um we started working in in the actually we we're in a day unit for a while and then like i went back to shift work um but in that time that we were together like i'd always talk about pro wrestling and how much fun it was like just watching and so if anybody can attest to my nerdism of pro wrestling it's actually that guy right there yeah so. yeah i mean uh unbelievable amount of, of useless knowledge some would say but useful for your uh for your field i mean you 100%. you spent you, you left no stone unturned in your your endeavor to learn everything you could about wrestling and and really just follow that that path i mean i'm amazed uh seeing you know your you know pathway to success after your military time i mean and i mean for what it's worth i mean I, I do expect a little bit of credit for the early days of your uh, of, of your gym workouts. I yes. mean, I did did kick you into shape at, at first back then. Yeah, that was a thing too. Like, like I think you know what people forget to mention is that like when you're in the military, like you're kind of responsible for like your own workouts and, and getting yourself together. But one thing that I never got talked about was that you're essentially a pro athlete when you're in the military. It just it's never talked about and. You know, while you were in the gym, I remember like coming and asking you and talking to you about like going in and working out and stuff like that. And then next thing you know, one thing leads to another. And I'm like, we were working out like it was like four or five days a week. And we were just yeah. like, I mean, in we the were... gym hard. <laughs> and it was good. We, we both had each other to motivate. I think the thing that took me out of that, that rhythm was when I broke my leg. I think. Uh... Yeah. <laughs> it, was softball. <laughs> it was softball that did it. Oh, you know, I mean, uh, softball, jumping out of an airplane. I mean, it's all the same when the story comes out. Now, I uh, I do joke around. People people do ask, like, oh, you broke your leg in the military. And I'll be like, yeah, you know, it's a rough landing, you know, you know, desert night, can't really always see. And then, oh, my God, wow. And I'm like, yeah, um, well, or sliding into second base. I mean, who's who's really paying attention? It was dark. It was, it was tough terrain. Military <laughs> you know? injury, squ squadron softball. So I'll never forget you and I talking about that the next day after everything happened. And you told me that you had put it back into place. Like it broke and you put it back into place. Did, and you, did like, you feel it? Did you see me just relive that moment? <laughs> I did. And then you, t you were telling me about how, um, you put it back into place and someone came to you and was like, oh, it looked like you just sprang in. He was like, you're like, no, it was turned 90 degrees and I put it back into place. No, man, it wasn't 90 degrees. It was 180. It was fully oh. backwards on my, 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 my leg. So like my <laughs> foot was backwards and I like looked down. I was like, that's not right. And I just went, boom, and then held it together right at the spiral fracture. And yeah, you're right. These guys can come over and they're like, hey, let's drag you off the field. I'm like, I'm not going anywhere. Like, I'm not going to call the ambulance. Oh, man, we think you might have sprained it. Not a sprain. I heard it pop. My foot was backwards. Uh, yeah. And, I mean, an unbelievable amount of pain. I, uh, the, the paramedic, when he did show up, turns out he said, and maybe maybe I'm, 
That was just him. I don't know. Don't take this as medical advice. But he said that's the best thing you could have done was try to put it back. Because he said when the adrenaline wore off and I show up, I would have had to do the same before putting you in that air cap. He's mm -hmm. like, so you did it with such high adrenaline, you probably didn't feel how bad it would have hurt if I had done it. And I was like, hey, that's good to know. I don't know if that's sound medical advice, but um, <laughs> I don't know. just the shock. You're just like, oh, that's not right. And you just- Yeah, that, that doesn't like, look right. I, I, I've seen that for a lot of people that would like, like dislocate their shoulder. I don't know if you see it in the wrestling side of things, but they'll dislocate their shoulder and be like, oh, that's not right. And they just do whatever they can to try to fix it. Because I mean, you know, when you look down at your body and it's not the way you're, used to seeing it you go into panic mode yeah no 100 percent. i remember um so for those who are current wrestling fans we'll call it that way uh there was like a, a sequence so one, one of the female wrestlers seems rhea ripley she actually popped her shoulder out of place uh in the middle of a match and you see her literally run into a table and pop it back into place no and then, finish the match yeah <laughs> really? whether, whether it was kayfabe or not i don't really care it was just a badass sequence that happened yeah. I was what, like, what i mean what kind of was it like announcers tables or like yes yeah, you just so it because you know the the story was that she had had a sh shoulder injury prior she came back she took she like ran into the buckle she popped she broke like popped it out she's like fighting with one arm throughout the whole match and then she turns and she looks at this table at the announcer's desk and she rams into the desk and then she moves it back into place and then she gets back in the ring and starts wrestling again and i was like it was a pretty badass moment <laughs> a lot of people were like holy shit like did she really did, was it really injured was it really i was like who cares like even if it was not real it was awesome that yeah she, like, I, mean, that's, about <laughs> <laughs> I mean either way yeah I mean, that's that's phenomenal and if, if it is fully fully real i mean that's quick thinking on her part but that's yeah. the thing is like you you see an injury anything and you're just like that's that's not right you gotta fix that um another weird feeling speaking of which and let me throw this one out to you and your audience and then we could get back onto wrestling but it has to do with it like when you see something so out of place in your mind your mind is used to seeing certain things right and if you just see it from a different perspective it really can throw you off so the other day i was moving my couch around i want you to do this tonight cliff I, actually let me ask you first does you or or you know your your spouse or whatever does anybody do you guys rearrange your living room at all? Or is that like the way your living room was? That's the way it is. Usually. Well, so like recently when we moved into our new place, um, we said it one way and we saw it. We kind of looked at it. We're like, it just doesn't look right. So then we adjusted it and we moved it. And then we got it to the way that we wanted to. But I I, I feel like I know where you're going with this. All so right. So, so you weren't dead set on it, right? Like it wasn't ingrained in your day to day. Like this is where everything is. Like your, your living room right now is probably to the point where you know, you could wake up in the middle of the night and navigate to your couch blindfolded and just be able you, you know it. Like, that's yeah. your life. You know where your couch is. You know how it's going to feel. But, like, you know, so, like, the other day I was, like, just moving stuff around. I pulled the couch out. Like, no kidding, just, like, four feet from the wall where it was. And I sat in the same spot I normally sit in. And it felt like I was just in a completely different room. <laughs> and I, it's such a little trivial thing. And I want you to do that. Like, you know, you and any of your listeners, just, just try it out. It's such a, it's a twilight zone. Like I, I felt like I was in the multi, like I just <laughs> pulled it out like a couple feet away from the wall and I sat down. I was like, no, nope, this does okay. not feel right. Put it back. Because like I'm used to just certain angles of seeing things and I saw everything from a different viewpoint. And I just felt weirded out. Um, uh, but, I'm, I'm sitting in an office chair right now, right? Um, doing this. And even if I move it like six inches to the left, I'm like, nope, moving it right back to the right. Yeah, it's, just, it's weird how our brain just becomes so uh, engrossed in patterns and just wanting to just be a certain way and just really trying to, you know, it shakes you up. I know my mother um, used to actually change around her living room. She still does. Every couple of months, a complete rearrange. I, I couldn't even imagine that chaos in my life. <laughs> no, i have to said it like so like we well like one of the newest things that we did so it's been a while since we talked so we lost duke a couple of years ago right our dog and then yep. we got a new dog named mccoy um rescue dog love her to death um the funny thing about mccoy was her crate used to be actually against our tv but then what happened was is we moved it because we wanted to put the christmas tree up over the yep. holiday season so when we moved her her crate over 
it found a new home because we were like, I'm just not moving it back. <laughs> I kind of like that it's it's there now. <laughs> I kind of got it away. I don't need that's, it. Now. That's what, that's where it is. It's, yeah, yeah, that's where it's gonna stay now. But it did take a little bit to get used to because like now, like Kira will put her like tablet and stuff like up on top of the dog's crate. And I'm like, hey, if that falls in there, bro, I'm taking pictures of you walking in there to get it because I'm not getting it for you. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to ask what, what you guys keep on top of your dog crate. Everybody always does. It always yeah. becomes an alternate storage area. Well, fortunately for her, it's all her stuff. Like, not not Kira's, but McCoy's stuff. So okay, like okay. Her, her treats and her, like, water dish sometimes we'll put up on there if we're, like, cleaning it. And then we'll move it back down to her, her actual uh, crate. Um, like, her leash and all that other stuff, like, stays up on top. So it's not like... It's like a coat and like a you know winter gear stuff. Unless actually, unless the snowstorms, and then that becomes the secondary rack. <laughs> yeah, of course. You know that's that's that. But all all extra clothes go on top of dog kennels or treadmills. Hundred <laughs> yeah, percent. Yo. So for those who are like trying to figure it out and trying to figure out why uh, Mr. O'Donnell looks so familiar, you would have seen him in the Super Bowl ad for Cheez Its. Um, <laughs> and you probably still see him now because I still see that commercial all the time. <laughs> it's, uh, it is still playing. And I, actually with, with my son next to me. Yeah, that was, and, the, that was so cool. Cause I remember like, so I remember watching the commercial and then seeing you and I was like, yo, that looked like Will. And then like the next day you posted up on Facebook. You're like, oh yeah, my, my son and I were in it. I was like, dog. Holy cow. <laughs> it's like, yeah, oh my it's God. funny. I, I do tell people. And so if anybody goes and watches the, it's the, che it's the only, it's the newest cheese it ad. It's been running for two years. It's obviously all over television still, but if anybody watches it, I'm not the guy in the red speedo going down the hill. I'm the, the father and the son in the fishing hut that the red speedo guy, you know, crashes through uh, his fishing hut. And I say that because, a lot of people will actually ask me, they're like, oh, is that you? No, I don't have red hair and a red beard. But uh, I did audition <laughs> for that role. That was my first audition, like, for Jesus. It was for that one. And uh, I went into that audition, and they, and they told us to bring, you know, we're, we would be going down to our underwear. So bring a Speedo if we have one. So I went out to the store. I bought a Speedo, um, a red Speedo that I could wear. Show up in normal clothes. They say, everybody, uh, please disrobe and put on this uh, this dressing gown, which is the first term for bathroom. Uh, please put on this dressing gown. So I, all of us, there's like five or six dudes in there, um, all, which is oddly creepy with any audition for like commercials, is that most of them look exactly like you in just various forms. It is, uh, I guess it's another multiverse reference. So you look around and you're like, because they, you know, they want, whatever they're looking for, they want, you know, middle-aged dad look and like then i'm gonna show up and it's gonna be a bunch of middle-aged dads but like I, there's a bunch of guys and we all have no clothes on except for re uh, red speedos or some people bought black speedos one guy was in tidy whiteies might not have gotten the memo but uh then we they bring us in one by one to do this audition in the red speedos and uh they were like all right what we need you to do is the commercial is going to involve somebody sliding down the hill and all their clothes ripping off so here's this like little bench set up this little block square if you can just go belly first on that and flap your arms behind you like you're doing a penguin slide and so like i was like okay that's fine here i am in front of a bunch of strangers in a red speedo uh you know doing this penguin slide acting cool um and so there i am doing it and they're like all right now can you picture like cheese it's launching into your mouth and i was like sure i can do that and I'm, I'm doing this like movement i'm like oh my god like the, the, the things you do for to live your dreams right and uh so i uh i end up leaving the audition utterly humiliated but thankfully they called me back in uh for a second audition with my son uh and we did an audition together and i got that other part but it is i don't mean to derail your intro of me but uh, we talked about the cheesy commercial that's like a valuable uh lesson of my life that uh I learned a lot about acting that day <laughs> well okay so the reason i kind of uh, i aside from the fact that i get to brag about you being in the cheesiest commercial um the other part though and, and you mentioned this right it, like it's nerve-wracking 
it's nerve wracking to be in an audition. And it's, it's similar to the concept of like being in wrestling, like your first wrestling match, like, bro, you have so much adrenaline going on in your body. And then you know that you have to stay like in character while you're doing it. So they're like, Hey, imagine that you're, you know, you're like, Oh, we're going to, you have this match that you all, you might've planned out. Right. There's some people will just be like, we'll call it in a ring. And at that point it's even more terrifying because you're like, Oh God, I don't know what I'm going to do. But then you have to like, you have to remember, like you're going out there and like, there's, you know, there could be tens, there could be hundreds of fans. So it's like cheering you on while you're there in the ring. And you're like, Oh my God, it's so overwhelming. And you, you have this huge adrenaline spike. And then you're just like trying to maintain like what's going on. So, and then you're also in tights trying to wrestle. <laughs> so like, <laughs> like, there's a lot. Like, yeah, and I feel like that's where you're going from when you talk about like, yo, you're in front of a bunch of strangers in like a speedo. You know, being in being in tights or whether you're in uh, trunks or you're in just like loose pants, whatever the case may be. Yeah, like, I, being in front of strangers. It's, you know, I guess I can't. I came to the wrong person for sympathy about me yeah. being in speedo. You're like, man. That's my day to day. Yeah, that's a. Hey, I can <laughs> like, relate that's, so I mean, much. That's your it. uniform, like I mean, that which is awesome. But no, it's like it, it goes back to what you were saying, though, man. It's like it is nerve wracking, and it and people will be like, man, it just gets it's easier with time. It's like, bro, I've been doing this for almost five years. No, it doesn't get easier. I still find myself like in the back, like nervous. Like, and they always tell you that if you have the butterflies, like if you get the butterfly feeling, like that's a good thing because it shows that you care. But I'm always yeah. in the back, almost to the point where I feel like I'm about to throw up and I'm like, oh my God, I got to keep myself like head together. Think about these things. I look like a deer in the headlights in the back. And then like I hit the curtain, my music's playing. And then all of a sudden, like everything goes away and yeah. I bust out that curtain, like, let's go. And then everybody's like, yeah, let's go Red Dog. And I'm like, all right, we're home. I'm good now. I'm back to being calm, but yeah. It, and it, it is, I think the thing is, is, uh, you know, that's where a lot of what you do, obviously, I mean, you, a lot of, you you have a lot of acting out there that you do. I mean, you know, you, you don't, I, you know, obviously like the thing is, is like some wrestlers, they keep up a persona all the time. Right. And, and that's, that's their art. Right. And that's maybe, maybe that, maybe that's method acting in a way, um, you know, you know, when they're in public, right? I mean, I think uh, The Undertaker, didn't he almost never come out of character? Almost never came out of character. Yeah, I mean, like, ama- like even when you would just see him out somewhere, like, he would still just, like, he wouldn't be so friendly because, but it wasn't that he was not a friendly guy. It was just that that was his act. And, and that's what people are used to. And, like, you know, the thing is, is, like, you have a stark kind of drop off and change between your real life persona and your, and your wrestling persona. Right. Know. You know, like it, it, a little bit, I mean, you come across as a, you, as a, as a, I, I don't know. Yeah. As a, not as nice guy out there in the ring. <laughs> when, like, okay. So like you still bring cockiness and bravado and all that stuff, but like, I, I, you, you, you you're much friendlier off like outside. Oh, yeah. of the ring. Well, when, when I'm playing a bad guy, a hundred percent, like I I'm arrogant, I'm cocky. Uh, I'm talking trash to the fans. I'm letting them know exactly what I think about them. And then when I'm a baby face, like I'm coming out, big smiles, big eyes, like fired up, giving high five to kids and random parents, right? Or I'll sit in the stand, I'll sit in the in the audience with the fans and just. I've crazy. seen a couple of pictures of you, yeah, <laughs> doing it all the time. But yeah, <laughs> I remember like one time as a as a uh, as a bad guy, um, as a heel, uh, I was. In the crowd, uh, I was walking, and this lady was like, "Boo, you suck!" And I remember, like, looking. I was like, "Shut up!" I was like, "That's the best that you can do." You waited all day to come say that to me. That's crazy. <laughs> and just keep walking. I remember at the end of that match, though, she was like, "You guys cheated." I was like, "I don't know who you're talking to. Your boyfriend's sitting right next to you on Tinder. He's trying to cheat on you." Oh, jeez. She, she turned and looked, and he he was like on Snapchat. I think I don't know. He was on a different app, but he looked up, looked at me, and I was like busted and then walked away <laughs> <laughs> he's like yeah you get me yeah it's like go fuck yourself but yeah like that's uh, uh, yeah i mean but that's the thing is like you know you you do put on that that persona and like you know it's uh once you're out there in the ring uh you 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 take it on right and like i will say i mean i i'm sure it has to be close you know with that adrenaline rush and what you do um does it feel like an out-of-body experience 
all the time. Yeah, that's and and I think that's a that's the thing that a lot of like not a lot of actors always get that feeling, right? There's some that do, some that don't, but like that that rush, that amazing feeling, that almost like you're just doing and you're enjoying it from like a, a different vantage point. It's a weird feeling, like. Um, and, you know, and that's, you know, you, you obviously get that because when that, you said, when that curtain goes up, boom, it all turns on and you become that, right? Whatever it is. And, you know, it is interesting to see a lot of those parallels in, in acting that you are out there acting, you're doing, you know, your wrestling stuff, but you're also creating an overall performance and you have to, if you walked out and you know you just stood in the ring and waited for the match to, the, the match to start, I mean nobody would you, you'd be done you'd be done. Yeah. Nobody wants to watch that piece. They want all of it, the flourishes. They want the enjoyment. You know, it's 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 it really is. I mean, it's it is elegant. I I didn't really appreciate professional wrestling as much until I started to look at it on the art form side of it and just really go. I mean, everything. I mean, there's because I love the thought of like art fusion, right? So you have, you know, you're working on a character, you're working on a performance, right? I'm, you know, I am going to go out there and I'm going to, you know, and, and you know, and there is improv. Obviously, there's a ton of improv at the same time. So, like, but like you could go, you know what? I'm going to go sit with some fans tonight. I'm going to go do this. You pre plan some of that, you know, that outside the ring performance. And then obviously, improv comes in, but you're also factoring in. What your entry song is going to be, right? Like you're bringing in the music because you know if all of a sudden you played "I'm a Little Teapot" and you walked out looking like a tough guy, you're probably not going to have that same effect, right? Um, I don't know. I came out to uh, uh, "I Just Want to Be King" from The Lion King one time. Like it wasn't my music, but the guy played it, and I remember like he looked at me and I looked at him. And I was like, "Yo, that's not my song." He's like, "What?" And then another guy goes, "Is this your song?" I was like, "It is today." His bail through the curtain just that's awesome that, i mean yeah and you you just you took it you took the reins and ran with it but you know what with your character too there maybe there is that sense of cockiness of i just can't wait to be king like yeah. you know you, you can play that you know but like the music's in, you know into it you put a lot of style into your your costuming like and so like that brings it in so like when you start to look at the overall theatrical performance of it on the art side it really is an amazing thing to see because, you know, if if some of it was off, it would take away from the overall like piece that you're putting on that performance. Hundred percent. And I, what's funny is that a lot of people that are in the wrestling business were like, you're you're one of two things: you are an athlete or you are a theater kid. And sometimes you were both. Like you were a theater kid and you were a, a, an athlete. And uh, one of my friends, um, Chaz Evans, who actually is the other half of this podcast. Um, he is a theater kid. Like he graduated with a degree in acting. Um, I forget. I didn't, I know he's out of New York and then he moved to LA and then went back to New York. Um, but he is, uh, he, he sends me, he sends me workouts, like these big long pages of like filling out for like actors, like what's your character? What's their motive? What do they do? What happens when this happens? Like, and so legitimately the 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 funny part about building up a wrestling character is essentially how you would build up a character yourself like we're building the world so that we don't have to actually think about like how our character is going to act in the world yeah and part of that part of acting uh, part of like wrestling is that you're going to put a bunch of yourself into whatever you're going to do right so like especially for red dog one thing that i like to highlight about him is that he's very loud and he's very boisterous and the one thing about him too is that He's just gonna say what's on his mind, which isn't too far off from me. That's <laughs> not. That is not too far off from. But we crank it up classic, a classic uh, Cliff. <laughs> yeah, yeah, a hundred percent. Like Cliff is definitely he's brash. He's very loud. He'll say what's on. It. There's no filter. He's essentially like Peter Griffin. Like there's no filter. It just runs right out. And then like <laughs> as a wrestler, I'm like, yo, let me just turn that part of it up to a, like an eleven, and then just go even louder with it. So. I won't even – sometimes I'll say some things. I won't even think about it. I remember this one time I had a kid tell me that I, I was yelling at a fan wearing a Dallas Mavericks jersey in New Jersey. And I was like, "Who? Would, I thought you were going to be like a Nets fan. I mean, they're a bunch of losers too. And I remember looking at this kid. I was like, right? And he looked at me, and he was like, you suck. And I was like, you're adopted. And it went back to like looking back in the ring. <laughs> like, you know, but it was like it's those moments where like 
I'm like, that would have been something I would have said naturally. <laughs> like, I was like, maybe not as like, I would have just committed to it. I may have just thought about it and not said it. I would have been like, bro, what? Who the hell is no, that? but the thing is, I think, uh, and this is where that, that, that level of, of extreme comes in. You would have easily said that in most settings, possibly not to a kid though. Yeah. There, like, like there's, there's where like the filter of like, who's the target. That's it. Like, yeah. <laughs> You know, four year old, five year old kid. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I think it was nine or ten because I definitely told him that his mom adopted him because they didn't wear the same eye prescription. Like it was just like the most random shit that I would think about. <laughs> but like some of those moments came from, and I I do credit the Air Force a lot for the way Red Dog is because obviously he is an Air Force veteran, Intel specialist, which was something that I did. But what made it even funnier was those moments that would happen on the ops floor were exact moments that I start pulling from for like Red Dog because like I'm gonna I was like oh this guy's probably gonna try to do some crazy stuff today I'm gonna say this and then like, I may improv it out and just do something completely different and just say something I remember one time I got hit into a corn into a, a turnbuckle I'm sitting down with my friend and I have my head on his shoulder and his character is like the super like dark villain like super serious all the time I just put my head on his shoulder like secret lovers and he was like i can't be next to you cliff he's like i gotta go <laughs> so he just like moved away from me but i think about these these moments all the time where i'm like i just feel like this would be an appropriate moment to say something stupid and i'm like let me just do this and yeah and it, it feeds for red dog because ultimately i want red dog to be known kind of like the deadpool of like the rest yeah of the you know i mean you know it's it's uh it's, it's the end right now right you gotta yeah. everybody Everybody wants, you know, and, and, and it comes along with, you know, different types of like, you know, you know, people, people are more vocal now, you know, with certain things, I guess. But like, yep. there's a lot more honesty that's just thrown out there. <laughs> it really like, is. I, I, I legit think of like wrestling for Red Dog as like social media for a lot of keyboard warriors. Like, I'm just going to tell you what I'm thinking. And yeah. You may like but, it, you may not. <laughs> yeah. And there you are there. And they're paying to see you. So yeah. like, you paid a ticket to see me, bro. Like. But I think about you because, like, you are going out on these auditions, you're always working and stuff like that. And, like, you know, someone's going to tell you, hey, we're going to imagine you doing this. Like, what's the what's the thought process and how do you find yourself to build a character that you're trying to work on, especially for, like, a pilot or, like, a short video? Yeah, I mean, that's that's a really good question. I mean, there's a, there's a lot of different methodologies um, that go into kind of building your character. Um, and you can pull from like, you know, obviously with, you know, and probably with wrestling, there's so many different styles, the same thing with acting, there's so many different, you know, tools that you can put in your toolkit that you may not use every day. So like, I'll go out to different workshops and, you know, get training from, from world renowned actors and, and, you know, coaches and stuff like that. Um, you know, cause I'm always trying to build my toolkit. I just don't know what I may need whenever, but one of the biggest, most important pieces is yes, yeah, really building that character's identity. You, you know, even if for an audition now, this is the crazy part. Not a lot of people know this, but if I get an audition in, I will generally have 48 hours to the first step for that audition. And it comes from my agent and she'll send me, uh, you know, what they call sides and it's a snippet of a script or a sample of that script. And it's just a scene or two scenes or three scenes. And if it's multiple scenes, it's because they have different kind of emotional elements that the casting director wants to see and so you'll get that in and you have 48 hours to memorize that script or or side memorize the scenes and be able to go on camera and do a self tape sometimes they're in person um they've kind of gone away with that a lot because of covid and so like you'll, the first step is you'll self tape most of the time and then they'll take you know the the 20 to 50 people they ask to self tape whittle it down to like and and bring those in for the audition because they they like okay well they've made the first cut but so i've got 48 hours to memorize all of the lines because i can't do it with paper in my hand i have to you know you have to do it off script um and then i also have to be able to build a character for something that i know so little about right now if i have access to a full script now i did a audition for a feature film uh over the summer a pretty big one. Um, I didn't get the part, unfortunately. Um, but I would have been. It would have been nice. I would have been working with Gerard Butler in it. Um, but they actually gave me the whole script to look at. And because now 
I get to see every scene that person's in and I get to see their interactions with other people. Then you can start building out that character based upon the first step is what you know, right? So what do I know about this character? Like, so you'll look at something and go, this is what I know about him when he's in a scene with somebody else. This is how this interaction goes. Now, let me go through this script and see, is he ever mentioned in any of the other scenes that you're not in? And that's something a lot of actors overlook. They just, they just look first, oh, where's my character? Okay, he's here, 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 here. And this is how he acts. Well, if I have a scene where I'm not acting in, it's always good to read and figure out because if somebody's talking about you, right? So the, they may be your your wife and during the scenes that you're in with her, they're, they're okay and they're good and you seem to have a good relationship. But then you find out that every time she goes out with the girls, she's talking so much shit about you. Well, that's a very big stark change in, in a lot of it, right? And it's, it's part of the what you know when you're building a character. And then based upon that, you have to kind of extrapolate out information and go, what I don't know. And the stuff I don't know, I have to make up, right? Like, you know, not all of it's pertinent to a, to a role, but like, you know, where did my parents stay together my whole childhood? Did they divorce? Was my father a good father? Because all of those little things, those little nuances, um, really help to kind of build your overall kind of traits as you are as a, as a person, right? Um, you know, a lot of those subconscious thoughts. So, you know, that's all having to take place in a 48 hour time span for just a self tape audition, which is crazy because most of that time, at least for the auditions, I have to spend learning the lines because, <laughs> you know, I mean, it's just, you have multiple pages of lines to learn a lot of times. And so I spend most of that and then I build the character. Now, once you get picked for a role and you actually get, you know, cast for it, that's where you can really kind of dig a little bit deeper and kind of really building out. And then, you know, even even out when you're starting to kind of build that character's trait, you also have to like, you know, even individualize within the scene. What is my what is my motive? What is my objective? Right. What am I trying to achieve out of this? Why am I? Why do I matter? Like and, and you know, one big thing I learned, uh, you know, Samuel L. Jackson talked about it a lot was, uh, you know, where you're where you're coming from and where you're going. Right. Um, obviously, I think that may be a little bit different in, in the ring, but maybe I'd, I'd be curious, like when you're doing some of your stuff is have that question before an alley, but like not you as Cliff, but where is Red Dog coming from before that match? What was he just doing? And just see if that question, if you answer that question, if that would change your performance, like, you know, was what was Red Dog out at church this morning? Eh, maybe not. You know, maybe not. Uh, was Red Dog at a strip club that morning before coming to the, you know, ring? I don't know. You know, but Red Dog as the persona, you know, and that you create that imaginary thought process. So where's he coming from? And then after this match, after I, you know, after I beat, beat my opponent, where am I going to? What's my next thing? So, like, I'd be curious if that changes, if you kind of walk in with that thought, um, have those questions answered before walking into the ring. If, if that changes anything on, on some of your motives and directions on the acting side, I'm just, I, I don't know. I, I'd be curious to apply some basic acting techniques and stuff to what you're doing and, and, and see if it changes anything. But yeah, I mean, that's, but you're right. The building of the character, it's a huge piece. I mean, it's, you know, because you're not who, you, you know, you don't want to go out there and just be yourself, right? Because, you know, I mean, that, that, that may be good for, you know, a one trick pony. Um, you know, certain actors do it. Certain actors, every role, they're they they do the same thing. What's I up, Sam know. Worthington? I'm calling him out. Don't worry, I got it. I I won't I won't mention any names. I you mean, don't have but, to. I, I probably will never be in the acting world, so I'll say, Sam, hi. We've seen you in Avatar. We've seen you on the Edge, and we've seen you in the Terminator. You're the same dude. I said it. I said it. But, <laughs> but you know that that's the thing is when it comes down to the casting, uh, sometimes they'll actually just go, hey. I want that exact role. And, and you know, maybe um, maybe there's more range to actors. And the, the thing is, they just get told, like, exactly what you did in this movie. I want you to do it again in mine. <laughs> yeah, I could definitely see that. Being I, yeah, I mean, the, you know, and it can happen. I mean, of course it can, because that's the thing is, like, once you have a marketable product, that's their, their marketable product. And it's selling, and it's and when it comes down to it, you know, I love movies and television on the art form, but to the producers and the 
studio exists, it's a business. Yep. And I, I appreciate the fact that they, they're they making money so that I can do something I love. And so, you know, it's it's a good relationship that you have. But like, if hey, if, if a studio exec offered me a, a role tomorrow doing the exact same thing I did in the TV show I filmed last year, um, which is on the Peacock Network, by the way, John Carpenter's Suburban Streams, uh, <laughs> a little, little plug for that. But if, if somebody came up to me and said, I want you to do exactly like you just did, but reading these lines instead. Absolutely. That's that's your answer. I mean, you know, I I get the, the reason why. So it's, uh, I don't know, I'm, all, I'm way off track. Bring me back. Yeah. Cliff. I know, I, I enjoy it. So I enjoy all of this because like, for me, like, the one thing I do for Red Dog, right, is I'll ask myself like 10 random questions like every day just to kind of continue the world because like the less you have to think about what your character is doing the more like especially in a wrestling ring right because you want to burn that in to be a second nature it's the same thing with acting right like we want we build this world up we talk about this character we feel out we'll figure out how this character is going to walk move how they're going to talk to what certain directions they're trying to head in perfect example that i love that uh where's he going where's he coming from where's he going aspect i haven't thought about that so i definitely when i'm putting matches together i'll start thinking about like that aspect but to me, I'll be like, yo, where, like, who's, what's Red Dog's favorite? Is it NSYNC or is it Backstreet Boys? And for him, it's Backstreet Boys, right? Like, is it, um, does, does he like, does now, he what's, like now what's Cliff's favorite? Yeah, uh, yes, Backstreet Boys. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but I want to see where the split happens. Like, <laughs> well, the split happens like, uh, Red Dog, well, Cliff's favorite color is blue, Red Dog's favorite color is clearly yellow. Um, yo, know, it's, it's just but clearly, <laughs> yeah, clearly yellow. Uh, no, I think about those things all the time where it's like, oh, like, you know, where does, does, does red dog like apples or oranges? Does he prefer bananas? Does he like, uh, does he, does he like watermelon? Does he like, you know, what's he, what's he doesn't like? What are the things that he doesn't like? Cause Cliff doesn't like pickles and onions. Red dog doesn't like salted caramel at all like you know what i mean just like different things so does like red dog like pickles red dog does not like pickles either he's not that fan so but it, let me I ask like push it down my throat because i'm gonna be like if i have to eat it let me tell you if there was a commercial where they're paying for red dog to eat a hamburger with pickles on it red dog is eating a hamburger with pickles on it because he's doing it for the money but if it's cliff better believe i'm gonna pass on that paycheck <laughs> <laughs> like yeah i, I want to know what what red dog likes that cliff doesn't like and let's put it to the test with some of your fans maybe they can bring it to the uh bring, bring it to a match <laughs> you show. here you go red dog i got you this i got you this spicy honey mustard you're keeping that spicy honey mustard unless it's got habaneros in it then maybe we'll commit it. to the bit commit <laughs> to the bit no it's it's fun because like there be things like, oh, trust me, I personally, Cliff does not like getting hit with his steel chair, but Red Dog, for some reason, he enjoys that kind of thing. Like, he's a glutton for punishment. And so I remember um, I came home from a show. Uh, so uh, my wife and I, we had came down from Massachusetts to Maryland. She wanted to see some friends. I had a wrestling show in Pennsylvania. So I was like, whatever, we'll make it a family trip, right? So we'll all go down. So we went down. I took this shot from a chair in the back and I had bumps and bruises all over. And I woke up the next morning and I just, just big bruises everywhere. And Becca was like, what happened to you? I was like, oh, I feel like I hit by a train. I was like, but I'm not going to front. I think Red Dog kind of enjoyed it a little bit oh. too much. <laughs> <laughs> Like I had a picture, like I have a picture of it. I'll show you after, uh, after this, after we wrap up. Um, but I got hit with a chair in the back and Cliff's first thought was this motherfucker. And Red Dog's first thought was, whoo. <laughs> <was sick. laughs> nah, bro. I was like, the glutton for pain was not there. But I yeah, mean, did, did you turn around and say, thank you, may I have another? I, you know what? Full transparency, I probably should have. <laughs> like, <laughs> I definitely should have. It was just a shock at first. And I was like, oh, I was like, damn, bro. I wish. I was like, ah. Oh. I felt like Denzel in that scene for training day I was like, oh, you motherfucker. <laughs> <laughs> well, at least you didn't turn around with like an erection. Can right. I that? Like, oh, I dude, give it again, bro. <laughs> like, but <laughs> it's funny because like the aspect of Red Dog, something that I wanted to kind of like pull into place, right, is that he genuinely likes being in pain. Because one thing about Red Dog is that a lot of his humor comes from a dark place. So yeah. that's the reason why he's an Intel specialist, he's former military, because you know, he's been to places that like only your 
like your nightmares would be a, a dream for him. Actually, not you, but you know, the average person's nightmares would be like a walk in a park for him because his places are so deep. And I think about that aspect of like, you know, if he gets hit with a bell, like he's gonna start laughing. Cliff really doesn't because I don't like getting hit with anything. But yeah. Red Dog would find that to be hilarious. Like I, I thought about there's there's a dude, uh, his name's Osiris. He's actually been on the podcast before. He likes to put on pressure points and stuff like that and like just lock in and, and put people in pain. And for Red Dog, he would find it to be hilarious. Like he would laugh that off, right? Because he's like, yo, I enjoy this. Like put a little closer, Tito, you know? And like he was like, I would love to run a match with you where like you're just laughing at all the locks I put you in. Like you're not screaming, you're just laughing. But yeah. clearly he's in pain, but he's laughing instead of like, and so he's getting pissed because he's like, oh, I'm getting more frustrated because everything I put on this dude, he's just laughing at. Hey, Cliff in real life, maybe screaming, but. Red Dog clearly is just having a good time. It's just an average Friday night for him. <laughs> <laughs> you just need to, yeah. I mean, so like with the, with the so the chairs, right? I mean, yeah, like so. I mean, how bad does it hurt? Are they are they real chairs? I got hit with the okay. So I've been hit with two chairs. One was a plastic one that was uncalled for. Um, that's a whole different story for another time. <laughs> but the steel one, uh, I it was also uncalled, but like. It was kind of like on the fly when I kind of knew like it was coming like for some I, I knew like I was going to get gutted right in the chat in the in the abs. Uh, but yeah, it was a real steel chair and it really bent like around so, my he, so across all professional wrestling. Right. Mm -hmm. So the chairs when people get hit with them. Right. And there's just chairs conveniently by the ring uh, waiting. Um, but like those are not like prop chairs or anything. Uh, so. There's one company that says they always gimmick their chairs. Uh, yeah, I don't believe that to be true because listen, like impact is impact. Like yeah. regardless, no, of without a doubt. I mean, yeah, but like you know, like if if I were in like a television show and I had to, obviously the stunt guy would probably do it, but you know the stunt guy would have to fall through a table, right? It's mm -hmm. going to be a specially made table that will fall apart and not injure, or panes of glass, or you know, not like the same. But like, so those are just regular like. Walmart chairs. So on the indie scene, a hundred percent, you're going to Walmart to pick up like a twenty dollar chair to get smoked in the back with. Um, but other places though, it's not so much. So like uh, a certain table, like in a certain profession, might have been pre. Well, I don't want to say pre cut because that's not the right word to use, but it'd be worked. It'd be like there'd be things that were taken out of it to make make it still like a table spot. Like you're still going through a table, but yeah, you're not getting hit with like a metal beam in the back. Right. Like, so obviously you're trying to, yeah, they're not, it's not the much Buffalo Bills bandwagon uh, parties. Right. Yeah, exactly. So it's one of those things, but there is a, there is some places that a, hey, you want to think that that's sugar glass, but that is not, that is real glass that people get put through. In cool. fact, there's there's a promotion and i won't use the promotion's name but everybody who knows the story knows what promotion talk about um you know another wrestler tried to tell another wrestler like hey don't use real glass it's you know it's one you're going to ruin the rent a car you're going to ruin our business with that rent a car and uh so you shouldn't do that and so instead uh on their pay-per-view on the zero hour on a pre-show match uh dude was knocks on the glass says hey oh this is real glass He's like, cry me a river. Dude takes the bump into the glass, and like you can see, it just shredded his back. And oh. like, the glass broke out, like the grass, glass bent in, and like he took a bunch of uh, uh, marks to the back. There's been other dudes who've taken like full pane glass, like just slammed right through it and cuts up their back. And just, yeah, there's, there's some places where they really Jeez. use stuff. Thumbtacks are not fake. Those are real, and they go in through people's. They go in through the skin, and you don't feel them at first, but you do feel them when you pull them out. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. Well, that's uh, that's, that is not an art form I want to do. <laughs> <laughs> There's some people who will ask me to be like, "Hey, uh, how do you feel about doing a death match?" I'm like, "No, I'm good. I'll pass on that." What about uh, what if we did like a hardcore spot where you went through like uh, you you went through like you went into like Legos? I was like, "Bro, I have a." I have a currently I have a 13 year old. Uh, when she was five, I hated Legos and I still hate Legos now. So I'm gonna say no. <laughs> like I will pass on that. <laughs> so when you what what is what is a death match? So 
deathmatch wrestling it's still an art form and it's a not an art form that i'm a fan of i'll be i love certain i, I like one certain wrestlers who are on that do it but those are the guys you see getting hit with like light tubes and they have like barbed wire wrapped oh, around. oh okay them. yeah they have barbed wire wrapped around like the ring or there's you know they're going to extreme spots like uh one of i'll i'll keep it a buck my one of my favorite wrestlers his name one of my favorite deathmatch wrestlers, his name is Nick Gage. He's actually a really good wrestler in general. I just want to put that out there. Um, he uses a pizza cutter, <laughs> like <laughs> run across no people's foreheads. Yeah. Um, even better, uh, the one time there's a wrestling company, uh, it was on TNT. Okay, they're still on. Um, Nick Gage made his debut at and Nick Gage wrestles for a company called GCW Game Changer Wrestling. It's a great, it's a great promotion. They they're incredible. Um, but anyway, so Nick Gage wrestled Chris Jericho in a death match. Uh, it was like a modified death match for AEW because it was on TNT still. Uh, but Nick Gage brought out his pizza cutter and he started running it on the top of Chris Jericho's uh, head. And this is just a spot that he does normally. Like, are we talking like just the single blade pizza cutter? Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. He just Holy runs shit. it. And so... The funniest part was he runs this this pizza cutter across his face. They're like, and you'll get more of this action in picture in picture. And they go to picture in picture. And the first commercial to play is a Domino's commercial. Oh, no. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so there was, like, so much heat. There was so much bad blood. Like, Domino's, like, threatened to pull their ads and stuff like that. <laughs> um, but, yeah, Deathmatch Wrestling, it's still wrestling. There's still stories being told. It's just to, like, the extreme, right? So you're going yeah. through, like, thumbtacks and, you know, uh, light tubes you're you know taking some some events have what's called barbed wire ropes instead of like the regular ropes you know uh steel chair or steel chairs wrapped with barbed wire sometimes you'll find a broom what's up kenny uh he'll have a broom there's just it's just a little bit it's way more an extreme you're expecting to see a lot of blood right because death match wrestling yeah um and then people like sometimes you have like fans bringing the weapons and fans let me tell you, some of you fans out there are fucking crazy. We'll buy a 60-inch screen TV to bring it to the show to watch someone get hit over the back with a the back or the head. Are you with a, I'm not kidding. Like these are things that have happened. One of my friends, one of my train well, my trainer, uh, someone brought a 40-inch screen flat, like a 40-inch flat screen TV for him to use as a weapon. <laughs> I mean that's that's just insanity. I mean, yeah. <laughs> you just spend the money on buying a TV. I want to see someone get hit in the head with this, bro. I mean, even the fact of just not even spending the money, just the fact that a fan would bring a, a television to have something. Else. I, I, I don't know. I watched like, I watched and what's funny is like I remember hearing about like you know they would do death matches, and I I never really watched them, but I obviously remember Celebrity Death Match, the little claymation MTV show. Yeah, 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 and like they obviously did some crazy stuff in there and ripped each other's heads off, but like I never put two and two together that like that was quintessential definition of death match. Well, you would have known it as like hardcore style is what a lot of people would have called it. So like you would see like chairs or like trash cans, trash can lids, like all that stuff. Like and then now you just think about it, just amplify that even more, and that's where you're at with like death match. So. That's that's um, crazy. I mean, and and again, like I appreciate it. Like you know, I hope hope your fans don't think when I say like that's that's crazy. It's like it's it's just for me. Like I I appreciate the art side of it. Like when you look at wrestling as that whole, and you you start to do regional breakdowns of this, all these different styles, and then you're breaking yep. it down within that region and, and types like North American like deathmatch or stuff is like wow, like. It's definitely you know, an it's, entertainment. It's side. another I mean, nuance, right? Well, there was a show in Torrington, Wyoming. Um, shout out to everybody who knows where Torrington is. Uh, GCW ran a show there. Nick Gage was there. Um, they were running a death match, and people thought it was so real. They called the cops, and the cops came through and like, <laughs> like stopped the show to ask questions about what's happening because they're like, "Yo, we heard that someone's killing another person. Like, what is happening here?" And Yo, they had to stop the show and they explained wow. to him, like, no, bro, like, this is what's happening. It's a very controlled environment. Trust me. Like, yo, they had to let him know. But the fact that don't I don't mind like, that guy getting tasered back there. It's cool. <laughs> he's agreed to it. Yeah, he's, he's, it's fine. And plus, you know what's crazy is that sometimes when you see spots like that where like a person is getting tased, it, it's always just like, it's just an illusion part. So, I mean, it, it goes back to like, there's a lot of cool stuff that like wrestlers like are able to do now that you weren't able to do 
you know, a few decades ago. And even at that, with deathmatch wrestling especially, like it's it like I said, it's an art form. It's in a storytelling form too. And like people are showing you like what's that? And some people will be like, well, they're just going in there bashing each other's heads with like light tubes and stuff like that. I'm like, yeah, but if you pay attention, like the story's being told to you. It's telling you why they're doing this. And sometimes it's hard to tell, but hey, I I appreciate the art form itself. So, and one of my good friends, Cade Lothbrock, who's been on the show a couple times, um, he's a former deathmatch wrestler, and now he just he just wrestles now. And it's so much fun to see him. Um, and I think I was like one of his first matches uh, when he left the deathmatch scene and just wanted to work at regular shows. And we sat back, we had full conversations and stuff. And, you know, and now he's like one of my good friends. And we chat all the time about like, now he wants to be a power lifter, but we chat all the time about stuff. And I'm like, hey, that's good you know, though. You gotta, gotta keep moving. Yeah. Well, at one time, like, I think he was like 400, like 400, 420 pounds. And now he's down to like 280, 270, 280. Yeah, he's That's like, awesome. and he's and he's like practicing like all the movements that you would see like strongman competitions do. Like he picks up the Atlas boulders and he's picking them up, throwing them and stuff like that. I'm That's like, cool. That's he's, good. He's, oh, yeah. So, but no, it's, speaking it's, of weight loss, you've lost a you've lost a bunch. Yeah. So I think when back in like 2017, I was weighing like 230. I was like way out of shape, and uh, I'd let myself go. It was because of Kira though. Um, she legit told me one day I was getting squishy and Becca laughed, which really hurt my feelings. And for those who are wondering yet, yeah, I just named my daughter and my wife. Uh, but yeah, she laughed and I realized I was like, Oh shit, I've become that guy. <laughs> I was like, I need to get in shape. Yeah. So, I mean, it's, you know, it's, it sneaks up on you fast. I mean, you just, you know, it happens. I've, I've yo-yoed up and down with my weight, but like, I remember I did see your, well, one of your status, your progress posts and you, you posted this picture of you two years back and then you now it's just like, wow. I mean, like, Good job. You know, it's uh it's it's we tough to it. have that level of commitment and stick to it, but like it's I guess the motivation is you running around the speedos, right? <laughs> Right. Well, you know what's funny is that um I really didn't think about getting into pro wrestling until a couple of years after I started working out. I had randomly saw a kid um in a John Cena t shirt. And so him and I started talking about pro wrestling and then I found out that he actually I like to call it the dark arts. People will call it backyard wrestling. Um so I went to a couple of their shows and started working at their shows. And then I just, I got started getting trained professionally. And then I just made the jump from there. And even when I started, like I was still kind of out of shape. I didn't really like take, I was trying to take it seriously, but what happened was the pandemic. So that kind of stopped a bunch of stuff. And then I just started slowly like peeling the weight off and like changing everything up. And then I got motivated and wanted to start helping other people, which again, this goes back to us being, you know, former military is like, you know, the one thing that we, we enjoy is that we love having a bigger sense of purpose. Right. Um, and that's what, you know, we get driven into doing that. And so for me, I wanted to, to give back, like I'm sitting here losing all this weight, getting strong. And I was like, yo, let me, let me start giving back to all these other people. Let me start helping people's lives out. And I became a personal trainer because of it. And so now that's, like, awesome. that's what I do. So now I just train people on the side and pro wrestling at night. Like it's just the way it works. That's awesome. Now you you'd mentioned. I'm sorry, this has turned into an interview of you. <laughs> I'm I'm trying to learn so much too. Um, so you mentioned professional wrestling training. Like, what does that entail? Pro wrestling training. Yeah, um, you said you went. You just started doing some, you know, pro, pro wrestling training. Like, what is what's involved with that? Like, so really, it's getting it's getting taught like how to land properly, right? You're learning how to take. Um, so anything that you see in a ring, right? And now everybody's going to see this behind the scenes. And this is what we've always talked about. Um, Are you so allowed to? Is it like, is there a wrestler's code where it's like a magician's code? Like, if there is, it's been blown out the water because of me, because of this podcast. So <laughs> it is what it is. Uh, You're no, going to get you your hands cut off? Nah, uh, no, probably. I don't know. Um, it would be a big, big toe. Thing. It's his favorite. Yeah, that's that's it. Just the right one, too. Um, <laughs> it's not like I've taken a bullet there. Not No. <laughs> um the the funniest part about wrestling is that so you go to you you want to tell everybody to go get trained right so that's previous that's someone who's been wrestling for a long time that's like now started what's called this thing so there's wrestling schools and then some people just have like you know wrestling areas where they just go and they just train people how to wrestle um but it usually entails with learning how to take bumps right and that's what it is when you see someone take get thrown on the back or they land on their face or they jump from like a hot like off the top rope and they land those are what's called taking bumps so you're learning how to like properly take these falls right okay um stage combat essentially is what it is right so when you're in 
you know, in acting, if you're a stuntman or something, you're learning how to take those falls so that you're not blowing your back out or blowing the shoulder, right? Just landing weird. Um, but that's what you're doing in training. You're learning how to take those bumps. So you learn what's called, um, you know, you take those bumps, you learn how to take what's called bumping on contact. So when someone hits you, you just immediately can hit the ground. Um, then also you're learning how to do moves properly, right? Because the one big thing is that like, uh, Liam Neeson talks about it uh, with Taken, right? There's this, there's a big fight scene that he has, and um, he was training on it constantly every single day with like the stuntman and all the extras, and to the point where they were literally having a fight scene, and they were doing it blindfolded, and they could, they they knew where every single person was at every single moment. And it's the same cool. thing in in pro wrestling. It's like you're working on these moves, you're training on, right? So you're like, oh, I want to learn how to take a power or to deliver a power bomb. Well, you're gonna probably take one first, so that way you know how it feels. And how you're going to land and how you want somebody else to land and then you're going to go practice on how to do it right whether you have a crash pad or you're just doing it on the in the ring um but you're just learning how to throw power bombs right you're learning how to throw a hip toss or an arm drags things like that so you're it's literally just it's you're going through a school just being taught how to do everything and depending on how much money you're spending can determine whether you're at a good school or a bad school um some people say i have a lot of bad habits but I've never injured. Well, I can't say that. I've injured one person, uh, oh, wow. <laughs> but that was so a like, freak accident. <laughs> so what is what's like the price range of like you say good, you know money in school, good school versus like from from this to this? Like what would be a top end school versus a, a lower end? You don't have to give the name, just price wise. Um, would- so it kind of depends also on the name of the person who it is, right? So let's say it's someone that's like worked at WWE, right? Um, and they open up their own school. They probably will be charging somewhere between like four to five thousand dollars, and that's on the top end. Okay. Know, in some schools. And how long is that school? Usually, you, and I, it depends on the person, right? So the school I went to cost me like twelve hundred bucks, and it's pretty pretty well. And I'll, you know, there you go for your price. Um, and then I didn't have to pay anything after that. I just paid that off, and then I just went and trained it for four years, like. But and like, I, was it like a couple days worth of training, or? No, we we're talking like at least a year. Oh wow! Training. Yeah. So, and usually they want you training, usually most promoters, right? They want to make sure that you're, you're safe, right? So they want to make sure that you're, you've been training for at least six, eight months and that you're doing consistently. Uh, because obviously it's wrestling. Anything can happen, right? I've yeah. seen friends. I've had friends tear the ACLs, throwing like a simple clothesline and just the footing happened and their knee just tweaks a certain way. And that's it. Like they're just done for a while. I mean, that's, that's a consider. I mean, that's a, that's a really good deal either way, even that four to 5,000. For a year long training, I mean, like that's some, some, place, well, some places they'll charge you four to five thousand um, dollars, and you're going through like you'll go through like what's called the six to eight like mini boot camp, and then you'll go through the rest of the time. You'll spend probably another year and a half just like training, uh, developing like character work, learning ring psychology, doing all sorts of stuff. So that's that's, kind that's, of- that's that's some really cool stuff. I mean, like you know, obviously, you know, on the acting side, they have classes and workshops for different styles of acting i've seen some classes even out here in, in london area for it's like a two-week class of five grand for two weeks Damn. so like you know to get that kind of comprehensive long-term training for I mean, that's 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 a good that's some good value at least it feels like it um yeah you know and you, for you to go through training you know for a, a year is it like well how like is it once a week is it how is it Depends on some places we'll have like classes that go three times a week and then some places we'll have one time a week and some places we'll have two times. Yeah, it depends on like the the training schedule and how people want to want to move. Yeah. Like that's it's, really it's cool. Crazy. And then and then like you you talked about like ring psychology, you talked about building your character. I mean like all of that, like it's 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 cool to see. It's really cool to see yeah. that breakdown of the art. Yeah, it's crazy too, because like you're thinking about the aspect of just like every good so just like every good part of a a, a any any movie right it's it's three parts it's three acts right and when you want to put together a match here you go for those who don't know uh you want to do the same thing you want to put those three acts together right so like at the beginning your you know your hero is doing their good thing right and then somewhere in the middle that's where the turmoil begins and then at the end you have what you have to finish right so you have the, the the wrap up so it's like you know does the hero come out victorious or does the hero get vanquished right like what's going on and and how it happens so you want to put people on like an emotional roller coaster i think of like endgame is like one of my favorites and uh infinity war like just the the ride over to those two yeah. movies that you're getting put on and you want to do that with fans like you want to put them on the same kind of roller coaster 
of a uh, emotion that they're just like, I don't know what's going to happen. Like I want to cheer for him, but you know, is he going to win? I don't know, but he's got my attention. And then, you know, you don't want it to be, wow. Thanks camera for just turning off on me. Yeah. I lost you on video. Oh, look, there I am. Hey, look at that. You so know what's funny like, is like, I, it's, it's been terrible. Let me, since we're at a, a quick break of you doing this, let me try to get you full screen. Of, <laughs> Cause I have had to squint just to see, hmm. um, like, I don't know if you can, I don't know if you noticed, but like, I'm like this because like, <laughs> it feels like I'm playing uh golden eye. Um, on the 64. <laughs> yeah. I remember when you had the four screens and it was like, everyone's on a, a, a you know, 20 yep. screen or less. And you know, that's, I'm like <laughs> trying to play, but yeah, I don't know. How, how do I make you bigger? <laughs> uh, I don't know if you can on your side with it. Normally, like, I think it was just would be me just playing with the solo layouts, but Okay. In this one aspect, it just it just has the two of us. But no, uh, uh, yeah. But like, like I said, can I move, back can I move closer? Is this, yeah, is this all right? Fine. Yeah, you're good. Um, this is yeah, too yeah, close. Yeah, that's. <laughs> you don't keep it all the same, right? <laughs> like it's all staying. It. Um, that's fine. That's, that's fine. <laughs> but what I really enjoy about enjoy about wrestling again, it goes back to putting people on that emotional ride to make them ride that roller coaster up, down, left, right, and you want them to figure out like, oh my god, where's this story going to go? Who's going to win? Who's going to lose? You know, and, and you're thinking about the aspect, like what's crazy is there's there's aspects of wrestling behind the scenes where you're you're looking at a certain person. And you're like, OK, well, what kind of story are we trying to tell with this person? Right. So similar to how, like, if a writer is a writing, he's like, well, what am I going to write about? What, what's the story that we're going to do? How are we going to name these characters? What are we going to do with them? You're thinking the same thing when you're doing it for professional wrestling. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's it, it is cool. So, like, if you're allowed to talk about like this, um, obviously, you're, you're giving that peek behind the the scenes but uh how do you determine who wins we don't we don't the the there's a person above us that always does that no like there's, yeah, a see that. there's a there's a person above you that will always do that so whenever you're talking about putting a wrestling match together the first thing that uh usually your your promoter or your booker will tell you is i want to see this person go over with that person we have okay. that. and even for those in the wrestling business they all know like whenever you go watch like wwe maybe you won't know but a lot of people behind the scenes will all know who's gonna win and who's gonna lose so there's a person that always tells because they have like an aspect of a story that they want to tell so they're yeah. gonna tell you who's who's winning and who's losing and there's a reason behind it and then they'll tell so you I will, yeah i will be honest i did i did at least know that a lot of people knew who who won because we uh so back you know kind of Obviously, after my military time, when I did production work and drone work um, on a camera, we actually were invited to go out and do a demo using a drone for WWE uh, because they were considering using the drones in the arena. Obviously, I think they they went with like they, they still do the cable cams, right? Um, and they started using like a blimp. Um, but yeah. at one point in the early stages of drone work, they were like, "Hey, we want to see." what if a drone could, could come in and get some cool camera angles that we wouldn't be able to capture right and so we went in there and it was like a day or two before in the bank i think that was the performance money in the bank, money in the bank? that's it uh apologies to anybody for getting it wrong but uh so i we went there it was like a day or two before the performance and we captured their practices um and so like and so, like, I knew that, like, I just didn't know how it was decided. You know, obviously, like, they put the coin or arm wrestled or, uh, you know, whatever it may be. But, uh, you know, it's, it's good to know. It's, I've always wondered that piece myself, like, you know, and, like, is there a point, like, let's say, like, I mean, you, your persona, like, if people can't, if a promoter came to you and said, hey, I want you to come here and I want you to lose, like, like you can push back or is and obviously it's is there just, or just I, I, no, I, no i'm not taking the role normally normally it kind of depends on on the person right so as part of being an independent contractor right you always have the opportunity to say no you can always tell them no like i'm yeah. not gonna do it right and even before like you know if you guys agree on a booking like obviously you know it is what it is um but the one thing about it is that you have that you have the opportunity to always ask like what's what's going on what's the motive what's happening right because if they're they're like well we want to build up our champion oh of course and let me come in i'll come in I'll yeah, get yeah, over yeah. and then you know your champion can win that's that's great you can do that and i i i love doing that job anyway like i'm 
I, for some reason, love the idea of being that, like, the hero that may not always get the job done. So I'm always like, I mean, we, we can call it hero. Other people call it stepping stone. Yeah, we can call it that too. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I don't mind. Like, I don't mind being that person. Um, but it's like, you want to know the story behind it. Like, you know, what are you going to do with your champion? Is he going to go there? Cool. If I don't, yeah. if I'm not, if I'm not needed for all that, then all right, man, like, you're just really just having me to come over and just, just lose for no reason. I mean, that's fine, whatever. But sometimes what ends up happening is some wrestlers will find out that they won't find out what's going to happen. They'll be like, yo, we'll go to the show. They go to the show. They find out that they're going to lose and then they don't want to go there. Or oh. you'll find out like they find out they're about to lose the day before and suddenly <coughs> I'm sick, bro. Like I can't make it. Like, oh no, no kidding. Sometimes that happens. Sometimes it'll be like, uh, Oh, I got, you know, and this is the thing. And this is what things I, I think people forget sometimes is that, it's called professional wrestling. Like you're a professional, right? And so sometimes you're gonna work with people that you just don't like. And so be a professional. Just go in there, do the job, do the business, yeah. and then leave. Like you don't have to be just because you guys don't get along in real life does not mean that you guys won't get along in the ring. Sometimes the best matches are made with people who just do not like each other. Yeah, I mean, I, I, they, they have to be. I mean, there has to be a level of you know personality that comes that that shines through that the audience picks up on you know that I mean, it's the same way with acting though i mean think about it like um you hear about all the time like two actors or, or an actor and an actress who didn't really have like any good chemistry not saying any names uh but you know who you are from aquaman so anyway you'll hear about it and then like they don't they don't uh you know they don't you're, you're gonna get me in trouble I can't like, get you in trouble he has nothing to do with this this is all me on my own yeah family. like it's gonna be somewhere <laughs> like I'm involved in this, and I, no one's gonna nobody's gonna want to work with me because Will's a great guy. Work with him, anyway. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but yo, it, it, but I mean, you hear about it all the time. Where there's, there's chemistry, just not the chemistry is there. No, right? no, of, of course. And, and the thing is, is like they do have chemistry reads, right? And, and that's that's an unfortunate part. I mean, it's, it makes sense, but like, could you imagine if you were the the perfect person for that role, right? And like. You absolutely, hands down, you were the best actor for it. But then you go in there and they pair you up with, you know, a couple different scene partners. Hey, try it with him. Okay, try it try with, 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 you know, this person, this person. Whatever it may be, it may not even be a romantic love interest. It could be, you know, it could yeah. be a buddy buddy cop movie and you just don't have that charisma with them. And so, like, you know, both of both of you guys were top of your game for, like, acting, you and your, your scene partner. But then you guys go in there and it's not you don't feel it. You don't yeah. feel that like, you know, that whatever they're looking for. And it's just, it, it is unfortunate because, you know, you, you miss out on a role because you just somehow just didn't vibe them, you know? And it's, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting when you start looking at it. Cause like, that's what the audience wants to feel something, you know, what, depending on what, whatever the, you know, the movie or, or television shows about, they want to feel emotion. They want to walk away happy, sad, angry, whatever it is. But like, that's where we as actors have to give them that emotional kind of, you know, push that nudge and they yeah. have to kind of relate to us in a way, you know, even though, you know, that's, that's something as an actor, you, you know, you are trying to create reality out of imaginary circumstances. Right. But not everything you're doing, you can relate to. Like if you have to play a serial killer, right. You, you've never put out and killed a bunch of people potentially, um, you know, but, uh, you know, the, but, you know, the thing is, is that you have to look at the root of it. Like, what is this person getting out of it? Why are they killing? You know, why are they doing it? What, what, what emotional feel do they have? And, you know, maybe in some way the audience can relate to whatever that is, that, that, that root of emotion. Um, you know, I think, you know, you, you mentioned uh, Infinity War and, and Endgame. Like, a lot of people, as, as terrible as a person Thanos was, one of the best villains in any movie. I mean, like, just you could feel, like, how he felt. Like, he, in his mind, he thought he was doing the right thing. And and Josh Brolin really captured that kind of emotional feel to it. And, and wonderful storytelling overall. Like, I would say that Thanos is, is one of the better villains out of non-comic book movies. Like, right. just because you, you look at it and you're like, well, listen, like, I don't agree with it. But I get it. Like <laughs> I, I see where he's coming from. I don't agree with it, but I see that line of thinking, and 
and I can see where you develop that that kind of thought process. And that's where like, you know, you want to have, you know, bring it back to the the charisma side. You want to have that that compatibility with somebody. Yeah. And so like, you know, when you're out there in the ring with somebody you dislike, I mean, you're you're you have animosity. You don't have to reach too far in your emotional tool bag to pretend you don't like them. Because right. you don't. And what's the perfect place to express that feeling in hand-to-hand combat in a ring? <laughs> right. Right there in the ring. Like, yo, you and I, one-on-one. This is what we wanted to do. And sometimes, like you said, like, you get great chemistry from two people who just, just literally just don't like each other. They're going to go in the ring. They're going to perform. But they don't like each other. So they're going to do things a little extra. They're going to go a little extra mile. Yeah. The best part is when you have a best friend that you're in the ring with. And then sometimes you'll just go the extra mile without even thinking about it. <laughs> I've definitely had that moment where I've literally, uh, I've like had moments where my friends in the ring where I've, it, I got smacked right in the face because my boy was like, we're going to turn the intensity up and just smack me right in the mouth. And I'm like, all right, we're going to turn this up. And then, yeah, party suddenly, on. Suddenly, suddenly, punch like, forearm shivers that were maybe a little bit pulled back aren't as pulled back anymore because like yeah okay cool we we gonna fill this out and we always joke about it like if you can't hit your friends who else can you hit you know what i mean like can't hit your friends hard and who can you really hit yeah so, i mean but you know in the end i mean you know as you know long as you do it is? safely it's you're putting yeah. on a, exactly. a hell of a performance when you're really kind of and the audience yeah. can obviously they'll they'll feel that you know they they know it and mm-hmm. you know whether it's animosity in the ring or even that 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 over heightened you know the friendship is still an emotion but you you just cover it up with your acting of dislike for the person at the time so yeah. it's, it's some cool stuff like I'm, I'm really you know digging like the whole you know artistic breakdown of wrestling that i think goes overlooked i mean i'd, I'd be uh curious like are there any documentaries that really break it down i you know what i don't think so i mean i know netflix uh when we we're recording this uh I think the Vince McMahon documentary comes out next week. Uh, but there are some there. I don't know if there's really any documentaries that break down like how wrestling, like the wrestling world is like yeah. how, how it plays out. I think really it's just more of like a, Hey, uh, it's kind of like a, I want to call it a well-known secret, but it's just, I don't know, behind the scenes, like, you know, people who work behind the scenes know about how the inner workings of wrestling goes, but there's nothing like and ultimately, it's it's a theater production, like and and the ring is your stage. You know, yeah. it's it's interesting because I mean, like you know, I've done a few theater shows, right? And and what you explained earlier with like when you're behind that curtain and you're waiting for the curtain to come up, and then you get that adrenaline rush, and there you are in front of people. Like, you know, I did. You know, I last year I was in uh, I, was, I played Long John Silver in Treasure Island, and so there there I am in the in the wings waiting to come on stage and you, know, you walk out like you feel the audience and you know it, you know it was 300 people each night um sold out shows and like you just all eyes are on you to, to perform and, and you feel that, that the energy of the people out there and like you know and you are going out there and that, that's where you're combining your trained artwork and a little bit of improv because you don't know what you're going to walk out to right those those right. stories you mentioned about like looking down and you know, saying that this guy's on Tinder or you're adopted, like those are just you, you don't know because like that that guy could not have, might not have been on his phone. And then what what comeback are you coming with? Then you got to come up with it on the spot. So, um, yep. you know that's that's some interesting pieces that I re- I really do enjoy, like that fusion of, of the art. Oh, uh, and what what I think was great is, and I, I I think of wrestling as wrestling is like the only place where like the crowd. But like, and I don't want to say the crowd doesn't matter in other places, right? But wrestling, the wrestling crowds are essential to wrestling, right? I, and I, I say that in the sense of like, where else can you go and you're actively asked to like boo another person or to cheer for another person? You can go to a comedy show, right? And you can British cheer. pantomimes. I learned that one, so we'll get to that later. But go ahead. <laughs> but yeah, so you can. I mean. Like you go to a comedy show, you're going to cheer for a comic. You can, Some people heckle, right? It, it is what it is. But they're not really – but the com- comedian's not up there to be actively heckled. No, right? yeah, yeah. Like there's so. another person literally active. Like I'm actively telling another person, oh, he's a bad guy. Boo that guy. And then the crowd's like, boo, you suck, right? <laughs> um, whereas like 
think about this, right? And I talk about this all the time. This is my favorite part of like talking about when it comes to to pro wrestling. In if you go to a musical, right? If you go to the, if you go to Broadway and you're watching Hamilton, you're not going to scream out. Alexander Hamilton really wasn't Puerto Rican. He didn't have that kind of hairstyle, nor was, you know, uh, 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 what's his name? Aaron Burr. Aaron Burr wasn't black. Like, you're not. I mean, we don't know. We don't know these things. I mean, There's no, we, there was no photography back then. We're, we're not 100% positive, but we probably could assume, right, that that's probably not <laughs> be a safe thing. assumption, I guess. Yeah, safe assumption. But, like, you're not screaming. Like, the, the Wicked Witch really can't fly. I see the wires. You're not you're not saying that thing. Like, yeah. you're, you're enjoying the performance. And so with pro wrestling, it's the same thing. It's like, yo, you're in a live performance. And, like, which is also coincidentally a sport, right, is what we refer to it, right? Wins and losses. Yeah, yeah. But you're in a compa- you're in a competition where it's actively being told to you, like, hey, here's the story that you're on right now. Uh, this guy's trying to win, and he's making fun of the other guy, and the other guy really doesn't like that, and so he just wants to beat up the other person. And, you know, some people plan their matches out that way, that they're like, well, I'm going to take these people on that similar type of ride, and we're actively going to have the fans boo the other person. Like, there was a, I remember there's a guy, um, his name's King Kalua. Uh, and he hates it when people call him pineapple head. And he literally, but the, the best part is he eggs it on. And I, I joined in. I, I remember first meeting him and just actively being involved in the match too. And like, uh, he was like, if you guys call me pineapple head one more time. And I just, I remember being in the, in the face, pineapple head and getting the crowd involved. And he's like, I will leave this ring right now. And I just kept going louder. And so the crowd gets louder too. And it's like, you're actively being told, like, you can say these things. I was like, hey, just expect that you're, whatever you're dishing out, you're going to get back. Yeah, like, yeah. It's going to happen. Um, but, oh, man, it is. A, yeah, it is yeah, a you're right. I mean, like, yeah, you can't, I couldn't show up to a West End performance in London and start yelling out. I mean, <laughs> but I will give you the little bit of history, as I mentioned, with the British pantomime, which is, a, you know, a, a new art form out that I, I had not heard of. So it is a mixture of it's a it's a play, it's a musical, it's almost old school like vaudeville, where mm. like there's a lot of you know, you know, breaking the fourth wall of just you know talking to the audience and getting them involved and trying to get them hyped up. And so every so my first experience was a couple of years ago. I did a uh, listen to. Um, and I played the evil baddie, the ogre. Um, so obviously a lot of people know Puss in Boots now of like the Shrek world. No, I was not Shrek. Uh, the original fairy tale, the ogre was a bad guy. Um, so I was the villain of the ogre. And they, they told me, they said, just know, like with Panto, you walk out and you'll, you'll be yelling at the audience. You'll be threatening to eat them you know, if you're an ogre. Um, and they're going to boo you every time you come on stage because that is the culture of what you do when the baddie or the villain, um, you know, comes on stage. Um, they're going to boo you. And I was like, okay, cool. And they're like, the louder the boos you get, the, the better you're doing, um, you know, try to, you know, and, and I remember um, my first time I went out on stage, you know, I think the thing is, is like they weren't expecting the big, loud American, right? You know, with, and I came out screaming. You know, I was yelling at the audience. Like, I, 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 I they're almost, uh, I remember like spit flying out of my mouth. I was yelling so much. There needed to be like a one of those Gallagher slash zones in the front row. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but uh, I was yelling at them and they're just, you know, and everyone's like, oh my God. And they're booing me and they're getting involved. And the more they're booing, the louder I'm getting and screaming at them. And I remember like, you know, this is my first performance doing the style of, of play, uh, you know, called Panto. And a bunch of Girl Scout, the brownies, the younger ones, they were there on like a, a brownie field trip. And they were like second row back. And, uh, you know, they started, you know, crying. And a couple of them went out to the lobby. And so when I went off stage between scenes, I went to the, the producer. I was like, Hey, are they okay? Do you want me to go out there and just like say, you know, everything's cool, it's all fake? And she's like, no, don't ruin the illusion. She's like, this is, you know, you have to do it. This is what a baddie does. And if you make kids cry, you know, then you're doing a good job. And you know, and I'm like, I feel terrible. Like, I'm making these poor children cry. 
Um, and she's like, no, you just, you got to do it. And I'm like, all right. So I went back out there and, you know, for the, uh, the ogre role, they had me in this big, huge wig. Like, so I had green, dirty face and a big wig. Um, and I walked out and, you know, I came out there and it was, you know, si- the first time I went out and it was silent at first before they started booing me. And some kid sees the wig and he goes, oh, look, it's Hagrid. And like, you know, they, they yelled this out. And I turned to this kid and I was like, you better be quiet, kid, or I'm going to eat you. And he was like, he's like, look, you know, and I, was, and I was like, well, I guess that's what I'm supposed to. So like, there were times that like, you know, you just don't expect it. Like, same thing. Like, you could walk out and somebody could throw something out there you just weren't expecting. And you just got to have some type of, you know, retort to give back to them. And I'm sure you get that. Like, has there been anything that's like completely just throwing you off like somebody's yelled something to you and you were like either like i don't know what to say to that or like that was such a sick burn like i don't like has that happened to you where you were just speechless no i so i haven't had it yet right um i did have a moment where i was the bait i was i was a good guy right i came out and i heard this one dude and he said he liked to cheer for heels anyway he liked to chill for bad guys and he was like um he goes I don't really like this dude anyway. And I remember leaning over and I was like, I'll win you over. Don't worry. And then later on, and, and I remember getting out of the ring and sitting down with him and just like eating his popcorn. With him. And, I'm <laughs> the guy. and I'm like, yo, I don't know about this guy. He's like, yo, get in that ring and we'll beat him up or else, you know, we're not going to like you. I was like, well, you don't like me now right now. So I'm just going to keep eating your popcorn. And so later in the match, I hit a sequence. I heard him laugh and he goes, Kind of like him now, and I put this dude in. I put my uh, I put my friend in like a a rest a chokehold, and I looked at the I looked at the guy. I was like, "Gotcha!" And then we went back into the match. That's <laughs> awesome. And, <laughs> yo, but it's like it's those things where like you really have to be on the ball, like being imp- like improvising wise. You have to be ready for anything that's going to be thrown at you. I've had. I said there was that lady in the crowd. Like when I first came out, she told me like I was terrible and like I was not like you're gonna get beat up. And then as soon as we lost. Or we won, and she was like, "You guys cheated." I was like, "So, like, I'm not gonna get stuff." I, I had somebody, um, at, and this was like the first time where I started to start really trying to embrace like on heel side of things, right? But I had a person. I'll tell the story, and everybody who knows from One CW knows the story too, um, in Delaware <laughs> especially. <laughs> uh, so I'm in the I'm, I'm with my friends, right? We're in the ring, and my buddy uh, my buddy Chaz was out there. And this lady, man, I don't know who she was, but she was like, um, your boy's looking a little frail. And I was like, bruh, this is, and mind you, this place is called Houston, Delaware, okay? It's spelled Houston, but it's pronounced Houston. So that's like, also a street in New York that's pronounced Houston for whatever right. God unknown reason. <laughs> but I was like, I go, um, I go, you can't even spell frail. And she was like, yes, I can. I was like, go on, spell it for me. And she goes, F-R, and I just walked away. <laughs> and she's got irate. But ain't we we'll get to the end of the match. Our team, our team wins. That's what happens. Um, and yo, know, this kid is just in pure tears because her his favorite team just lost. And this lady going off. And I'm like, yo, look who's in tears. Oh, look at you. You just so mad right now. I stopped acknowledging the kid because clearly he's in tears and i was like i don't want to provoke any more than what i'm already yeah, at yeah. so i'm looking at the parent and i'm like yo this is what it, this is what you get you wanted this this is what's happening i was like yo and i grab my friends right like yo come here come here come here look at this guy right here look at this mom right here being so mad yo she said a comment that should have froze me in my place in real life as cliff i would have dropped everything she goes, he's crying, but his mom just OD'd. And I split my friends like, we don't care. And we walked off and I went oh. to the back. And as soon as I walked to the back, I closed the curtain and I go, we're going to have to go talk to that kid. Because <laughs> I was like, oh, my God. And then my buddy was like, no, we're going to keep it going. We're going to just how you because how they told you, right? Like, don't say anything. Like, just you keep the illusion right i was like yo we're gonna have to talk to that we're gonna have to get something we i don't know what we're gonna do but we gotta go apologize and he my buddy was like no we're not gonna apologize we're gonna keep it going he's like that was good shit and uh sure enough like 
in the middle of the show, we did our intermission and everybody was getting back to their seats. But this, these two people weren't there yet. And lo and behold, I had a feeling in my heart. I was like, it's going to be the last people walking. They're gonna, it's going to be them. It was. It was them. And, yo, the woman walks up to me, puts her head on my shoulder, and she goes, I'm so sorry. She's like, I don't know what came over me. I don't know why I said that. I'm so apologetic. I was like, well, is it true? And she's like, well, it is true. But you got me so riled up that I just got in the mama bear mode. And I would choose, like, I did not expect that to happen. Wow. <laughs> like, but you know, it was just like pulling that much emotion and getting her to be at that point where she was so mad. I was like, it is what it is, bro. And, yeah, I mean, you know, right. <laughs> but I was like, I, I I'm like, on the fence about that. Yeah, I just, like, continuing I, on. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm glad I, it didn't, I guess. Uh, yeah, I'm, I mean, the real life story, like, it was very sad. But in that moment, I was like, yo, I got oh, yeah. as a character. I was just like, nah. I was like, yo, we won these titles. You said we weren't going to win. Now you're trying to pull out the big guns, and we don't care. And it walked off. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, and if that's if if that's what they're expecting, right? If that's yeah, that's what the audience is expecting out of you, out of you know that that performance, like that, they walk away with you know job well done, like you you did what they were expecting you to do. That that mm -hmm. level of performance, like, yeah. and you know the thing is, it is cool, like you know you sitting down eating that dude's popcorn too, like that's a story that this dude's gonna tell, you know, like. You know, let's say you continue to climb up the the wrestling, you know, ladder, and and you become absolutely world famous, right? And you know, this guy's gonna go. I remember he was sitting there eating my popcorn, and you know, that's a story he can tell and and really kind of walk away. I mean, like you, like that's what I I enjoy, the, you know, about these interactions and what you're doing for for your uh, your customers, I guess. You know, your you're, you're, I mean, obviously, you're fans, you know, fans. if they yeah. like you, but you're ultimately you're you providing you still be a fan, even if you don't like me, you can still be a fan. <laughs> <laughs> ultimately, you're pro providing a service, and, and they're walking away with a hell of a story. And that's, that's what's cool actually, about it. Like, actually, there, so there, was, there was a moment that I was speechless, um, where I didn't say anything because I didn't know how to react. Uh, I'll tell you, I, this is how it goes. So I'm in this ring, right? One of my favorite things to do is I go get thrown up on the rope and like someone will act like they're choking me and I'll reach out to like somebody. I'll look for someone who's like, I can see that clearly has like something attached to me. And I'll, I'll be like, yo, tag me in, bro. Like he's choking, tag, tag me in. So there's this little girl at this place called NCW um, in Pennsylvania. Um, and so I see this little girl and I reach out. I'm like, yo, tag me in, tag me in. He's choking me, help me. And so, like, she just reared back and just, like, puts her hands, like, tight to her chest, right? And so the match goes on. I end up winning, right? And um, so in her mission, I'm selling my gear. Right? I'm selling merch, right? This little girl runs up, and she hugs me, right? And she is full-blown tears, just crying. And instantly, uh, and, and this girl was probably about the same age as as my daughter right so red red dog switches off dad mode comes on hey is everything okay like what's going on you good like where's your dad where's your parents at like what's happening you know and i'm asking all these questions and then i hear i've never seen this before and i look up and it was the girl's father and she she doesn't walk up and hug strangers at all and i was like oh and then that's that that motion oh well we won right it's like i know and she's like but he was choking you and he was so big and i thought he was gonna hurt me too oh. <laughs> and i was like oh we got him and so like it was that moment where i like i my brain switched off because i was like oh like dad mode instantly like i gotta take care of this kid like something's happening yeah. i gotta make sure what's going on and then as soon as i heard her dad say she doesn't hug strangers at all this is crazy that just oh we're perfectly fine with that. What's going on? <laughs> so, yeah, that's, that's so cool. Work. I mean, and you know, it's just just think of like you know years down the road. I mean, this girl could be telling the story. Like, I remember, you know, he's reaching out for me, and I know, I know. I mean, hopefully, it turns into something positive. It's not like he was reaching out for help, and I refused to help him. <laughs> <laughs> now she's like somebody else is going to be like. Just imagine if she goes off to being like a vigilante, like a like a bat girl type. Like she's like this one time. It was a wrestler who reached out for yep. help, and I refused. But I refused Never to turn again. down anybody again. I'll help everybody. <laughs> you know? 
she becomes like the ultimate Girl Scout. Like, you know, she's I like, am oh, Red Dog this. of the night. I'm the, I'm, the, I'm the Red Dog of this Girl Scout <laughs> company. <laughs> you know? she'll, I can she'll, talk. Yeah, she'll, she'll just, she, you, you put her on this path of vigilante justice. Great <laughs> job. <laughs> Let's go. That's what I'm doing, inspiring one kid at a time. <laughs> You never know. I mean, you know, that's that's the, the beauty of it, you know, and I'll I'll give you like so I do uh I do cosplay stuff, you know, like when I go to Comic Con just for fun. And uh I was and it's funny because like so I got this one. Do you remember the movie uh, Little Monster? I don't know if you ever so I posted uh, a mask, so I got a silicone mask that was made for the from this movie, so I could be uh Maurice. It's one of my favorite movies from the eighties. Uh, I was Howie Mandel's first like feature film role um and he played maurice which i've got a sequel idea if anybody wants to uh you know help me write it um uh so he uh so i got this the mask made and it's like form fitting and it's cool because like when you move your mouth like it moves with you and stuff like that and so i went out to a comic con and i had made like the whole vest he had in the movie and it was a pretty good rendition of it and obviously the downside is it's such an obscure movie from the 1980s not many people even know who the hell you are cool costume but like you get like 40 year old men that come up to you and just go oh man maurice um which is fine i'm not going out to co comic cons to pick people up by any means but like that's just what you get it's you know it, it uh you know that's your demographic that's cool <laughs> you know what um, you're for. <laughs> yeah i mean like you know i i'd love to have more attention of you know when you put so much work into something um, but uh, I was I was walking through Comic Con and I had just I was there with my kids and I had just gotten food at like a food truck and I brought it to them and then they were like oh they messed up the order can you run it back so I am like on my way back with like their the bad order I I'm, I have to wait forever to get the new order and I'm walking back to them and I've got their hot food all ready and I, all of a sudden everybody wants to take pictures like I went from like level of obscurity to boom boom and i'm like i'm holding food for my kid hey maurice can i get a picture with you and it's just like i'm in that like mode of just like i want to accommodate i also have a responsibility but i'm like sure i put the i noticeably put the food down that i'm carrying and i'm like i've got a second and uh because the thing is is like then they take the, the picture it was them and like their kids and they took this picture and they're like and, and i remember the father saying to his kid he was like remember that movie little monsters i showed you guys a couple months ago that's maurice it's the guy the, the monster under the bed and the kids were all like oh yeah and like that just like small token of like just me helping them relive a, a fond memory like that they could take with them like it, it's just like that's the rewarding part and you get that too when you're out there dealing with doing crowd work is such 30 seconds of your time right yep. can be a memory that they talk about for years like remember that time we were all at that the, the match and you know red dog came over and you know he started yelling at mom <laughs> whatever it may be like it's still like it's a memory that they take with them and can talk about for generations you know grandma tell that time that 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 uh wrestler you know yelled at you you know whatever it may be you know just the small things and like you appreciate that and like you know those are the things that i i do enjoy you know and i i know obviously there's a lot of actors out there that you know are introverted you know and they 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 do their work and they don't want to be bothered out there um i'm obviously an extroverted person i enjoy people i enjoy you know making memories obviously you know there may be a time where you need peace right and so a lot of actors get to that point in their career where they're like they can't go to you know a supermarket without being hounded in every single aisle for a picture right and i can understand that you know probably that could get annoying right of course i'm sure it does at a, at, a, at a certain point but like at the same time like the little just 30 seconds of your time that creates a ripple effect of of happiness that can last generations is you know it's a it's a small price to pay um to just influence positivity right and yeah. uh like i went to a comic-con and I saw one of my favorite actors, and I always mispronounce his name because I've heard it so many different times, and I don't think I've ever heard him say it. But uh, John John Reese Davies or John Rice Davies, he's uh, he's the actor that played uh, Gimli in Lord of the Rings. Um, 
He's also obviously Sala in the Indiana Jones, uh, you know, Crusades. Um, and then I say Crusades because it's not no longer a trilogy, I guess quadrilogy right now. Um, <laughs> so uh, kind of a cumbersome word, by the way. But uh, and then also from uh, my favorite TV show, Sliders um, in the 90s, like before, obviously, everyone third multiverse reference, by the way, um, interdimensional travel of. Uh, Jerry O'Connell, and he he goes from different dimension to dimension um, back in the 90s, but John Rice davies played Professor Arturo, um, which is, you know, and that character portrayal, I loved him in that in the 90s, I loved it. And I went to see him in a Comic-Con, and he spent time just kind of with every single person, giving them just a unique experience, right, of just different things. And I remember somebody came with, a, with the Gimli axe, and, you know, I wasn't even involved in it. I was like two people back. It was just, so, and he looked at this and he goes, he stands up and he's holding the back and he's just like, what a fine looking ass. And it was just like, wow, like goosebumps immediately. Like I was, you know, got to see, you know, this wonderful performer. And I don't, I don't like fangirl gush over celebrities or actors. It's like, and I never have, even before I was an actor, it's just like they're a person doing their job, doing something they love. But those little things that you can do, like him just doing that and standing up, like that's a memory that person's gonna have for the rest of their life. And he signed it and gave it back to them. But like, even me, I'm talking about it years later and it was something so minor that you can do to show and have influence in a story that that person will tell. And like, I hope that like, you know, a lot of the, you know, the other wrestlers, like you obviously seem to appreciate that, you know, that level of interaction you have with, you know, your, your fan base or your non-fan base, right? That guy that said he's just not going to like you. And you're like, oh, I'll win you over. And you yeah. did. And, and, and you stopped in that moment, in the middle of a, of a, of a fight, right? In the middle of a match. And you gave him a personal, like, you know, told you, you know, and like nobody else in the entire arena probably had any idea what you were talking about. But that guy in that moment, you guys, you guys clicked and, and that, that you, you created that like memory that he'll have for the rest of his life. But it's cool. It's cool to think about like that. That's a whole piece of the art that you enjoy. You know, you, you have to enjoy what you do and enjoy those fans. Enjoy the, you know, enjoy the people and, and give them that, that memory to take home with them. I think what people forget is that and, and it's something that you're expressing and like just talking about and you can just, and if for those who aren't picking it up, you can definitely pick it up now. Uh, just the passion that you have behind, whether it's cosplay or acting or, you know, even doing uh, the drone work that you were doing, whether it was for Celine Dion to WWE or just for yourself, like all that stuff, like you just have like this passion about it. And that's, that's ultimately like what it is. Like you gotta remember, like we, we got into doing the things that we wanted to do because we were, we were excited about it as a kid and we developed this passion about wanting to do something bigger. And that's where we are now. It's like, here you are going out doing all these plays and then doing TV shows and stuff like that. And, and you have all this passion behind it because you're living the dream that you've been chasing after. And then even yeah. for me, like I'm in a ring, I'm having fun. I'm wrestling with my friends and then like, we're going out and beating each other up and then just like laughing about it. But the crowd, like there's a passion behind it. Like people can genuinely, when, when people feel that you're genuinely being who you are and having fun doing it, they relate to it so much more and yeah. they, they build up that camp, that, that fan base. It's funny. Cause like there's been certain wrestlers that I've worked with and I've been in the back. They've just walked in. I'm like, who is that? Like, I don't know, but I genuinely, I want to go talk to them. And so like, honestly, like this podcast only started because one, because of the pandemic. And when I was training, I was like asking questions. To everybody I was like, Oh, this would be a lot of fun to do. But then after a while, like, I would go to different locker rooms. I talk with people and then I would just be captivated by their story. And I'm like, yo, can't, come on a podcast and come talk to me. And then it, the, the more I got around people, the more I started to like having conversations. conversation, the more I got around, they're like, Oh, Cliff has a podcast. You just go to be on it. It's a lot of fun. And then I'm like, yeah, everybody come be on my podcast. And then, <laughs> <laughs> now people see like, I'm very passionate about this podcast, like five years running with it. And then it's all about wrestling. Like, yeah, like I love talking about professional wrestling. Um, and and working on whatever it is, and just like you, you know, when it comes to acting, you you love acting. Like you have to love the thing that you're doing. Otherwise, 
what do you really you're not really like enjoying what you're doing and i'm sure there's people out there and in all fields there's probably somebody out there right now who's in in a cubicle watching this thank you for that that's enjoying crunching numbers and then at night they go out and they go watch like pro wrestling and they're like oh pro wrestling is so cool but i can't wait to go fill out that tps report tomorrow it's gonna be (laughs) awesome like and i love that that's that's where i'm at with life i'm just like yo like be passionate about what you're doing enjoy what you're doing and and you know no that's you're you're a hundred percent right i mean that's that's a big piece to it is you know and i've actually i've recently been invited to a couple uh like grade schools, so elementary school equivalent out here to just kind of talk to kids, right? Um, talk about acting, talk about some, you know, because, you know, obviously with me, you know, if you look at my, my full resume, right. Of just the crazy stuff, my life, you know, you know, military, uh, after the military worked for the government for a little bit, then obviously started a drone company. The stuff we did in the drone company wasn't just film and TV work. Like we started doing survey mapping, we got into the oil industry, we were doing industrial inspection of pipelines, power lines, we were introducing like machine learning, AI algorithms, like start getting into like the tech side of like heavy tech. Um, You know, I was a NASA test pilot for a summer uh, on a drone program. And then I was also an FAA test pilot doing, you know, unmanned system stuff, um, which obviously, you know, all of that. And then obviously won a primetime Emmy for camera work and then became an actor, right? So I've got this like, so I go there and I talk to the kids and I'm always, you know, saying like, hey, like, you know, there's two two big takeaways from from what I can tell you you guys, you know, I'm, you know, when I talk to the kids. One is it's never too late to change, right? Like a lot of people just think like, oh, this is it. Like this is my day. This is my life. This is the what I'm going to be doing. And, you know, it doesn't have to be. And I get the fact that there are mitigating circumstances where like it's hard right you know I, i've got a family i have a responsibility I, I, have to, I can't do this but like you know for certain cases like you know find a little a small amount of time in your day to start inching towards whatever you want to do like you know it may take longer like but like if, if for instance if today i said you know what i want to be a lawyer right I, I mean, obviously, you know, I, you know, responsibilities of financial responsibilities, but like, if I did say, hey, I'm going to take out student loans, I'm going to go to school. And in a few years, obviously, you know, depending on how much I go, whether I go full time or partner, I could just be a lawyer, like down the road, I could, I could do that. Right. And so like, so many people think like, oh, well, what, if, you know, six, eight, 10 years, like what, you know what I mean? Like, but just think in six, eight, 10 years, or however long, if you start that journey today, one but one step at a time, you could have a whole completely different life by that, you know. And it does take work to find your dream. And I tell the kids that, like, because you know, for me growing up, like, it was always like, pick your career, go to school for it, do your career, and that's 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 your life. Like, that's what you do. And like, I just I don't like to be just beholden to that rule set. Like, where I was, I was like, I don't like this. And like, it took me a long time to find my dream my passion something i wanted to do since i was a kid and i finally got to the point where i could do it and that's the second piece that i tell this the kids is you hear all your life if you love what you do you'll never work a day in your life right how often do we hear that right and not a lot of people can equate to that and i never never could the military stuff yeah i loved it i thought i loved it but ultimately it's you know a, a a, a, sim, a symbiotic relationship. We both got something from each other, right? The drone work, it was the same thing. Like I enjoyed it, but did I love it? And what really, when I hit the acting world is the thing that really clicked for me in understanding that kind of ethos of what that, that you know, what people tell you is if I put $20 million in your bank account tomorrow, Cliff, are you gonna wrestle still on your next match? And you're, the answer is yes, right? Like, it doesn't matter how much money you could possibly have when you're living your dream and when you're living your passion. That's what matters. Like, yeah, obviously, that would make life a whole lot easier, for sure. You could you could drop all of the extra stuff that you do and focus only on that dream, right? And that's obviously what everybody's goal is. But, like, that's, I think, the key is when you start to realize, like, how many 
how many jobs did you have before wrestling of what you did in your life where if somebody dropped 20 million dollars in your bank account that you wouldn't just walk out the door the next day oh like everyone just be, oh, that's it like yeah <laughs> I, i'm not gonna be here like God. find me on a beach in hawaii right. like <laughs> <laughs> But the thing is, is that like, you know, that's, that's the key, I think, where, where you start to realize like, this is love. Like, you could continually put money in my bank account until the bank said to stop and I'm not giving up acting. And that's why I think even, you know, you see so many actors act until they're in their 70s, 80s, 90s. I mean, look, Morgan Freeman, like, he's doing it. Like, he's yeah. just, just driving on and he's, he's going to do it. And, you know, and continue on, you know, some actors, you know, they, they get their fulfillment and they do what they need to. And they get to a point where they're like, I can't do it the same way I want to. And they have to retire for, for physical or mental reasons. And that's, that's fine too. But like, you know, the ones that, you know, that's why you see so many, just like, you're not going to see too many people running their careers until they're 90 years old, you know, like, because, but they're following their dream, their passion. You know, and that's that's the big takeaways I tell a lot of these kids. And like, I see it in you. I see it in a lot of, you know, different actors as well. Like, you know, they if if somebody told me they were putting a production studio out in Siberia and I had to live out there, but I could, you know, be in movies and continue to act. I had guaranteed movies and TV out there like in 20 foot snow drift. Cool. Sign me up. Like, that's what I need to do. Like. Give me my week in Hawaii every once in a while, but you know, let me get to the beach once in a while. But like, but that's that's the dream, that's the passion, right? Like, that's how you know. Like, if if I had to live in a cardboard box outside of a casting studio to get roles, like if that if it was guaranteed, like I wouldn't roll the dice on it. But right, like right, that, right. <laughs> yeah, but that level of passion, like you know, you you have it too. Like you know it. Like you shook your head when I said if you had twenty million in your bank account, you you wouldn't nope. get up wrestling. Nope, not at all. In fact, I'd be like taking this 20 mil, I'm gonna pay off some of my debts, right? Because that's important, right? And then put some stuff away for the future. And I'm probably taking a cool mill and I'm like, all right, here we go. And I'll go right over to my job and I'd be like, hey, listen, uh, I'm leaving, uh, but I wanna start a gym membership here so that way I can just continue to come here and work out. <laughs> I don't have to do this now. I'm out, bro. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, and then, you know, you focus all, all of your time and energy into you know that world right who knows you, you could start your own you know wrestling production you know whole whole show yourself you know have you know really kind of be in control of your own of everything i think that's a, what's what's crazy what's the other part too and, and you're talking about this is that sometimes like you find out like let's say like for for me right i'm getting into the pro wrestling scene and, and working matches and, and be, you know building a character and stuff Sometimes you're finding out is that like, yo, know, even if you're leaving your dream as like you're like, oh, I've always wanted to be a wrestler. Sometimes you, your dream changes, right? And it's not, and I'm not, not saying, and I'm still saying, like you still want to be in the wrestling business. You just want to do something else, right? Yeah, like, yeah. Like, and everybody who gets in, like, let's we can use Clint Eastwood is a perfect example of this. Clint Eastwood came in as a as an actor, and he was a he's a really good actor. But then guess what? At time, his dream changed, and he no longer wanted to be just an actor. He wanted to be a director, and he wanted to be a producer, and he yeah. wanted to be, you know, a writer. And so you see the things that he does, and like now he transitioned, but he's still living his dream of being in the acting world. Like he's still there. Yeah, he's, it's he's, like, he's creating art. Yeah, you know, in, in some way, he's influencing, you know, somebody's emotion when when they walk out of the cinema you know whether he was acting or he wrote it or he directed it like he influenced you know and, and gave them an emotional response and that's that's what art is right i mean like when you really break it down like art is give ha, giving somebody a, some way to have an emotional response now what you know even if you're a painter right you, not every painting people like but they may have an emotional response to it you know it's they're going to have something they're, they're not going to look at it and just walk away going I do. You know what I mean? Like something like, oh, I really like that. Or no, I, you know, I, I think they could have done the brush strokes better this way or, you know, <laughs> you know, whatever it may be. I'm not a painter. I, I, it ends. It ends at brush stroke. Like that's uh, <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> they could have changed the hue. Yeah, I don't know. But, uh, you know, and, and that's the thing is like and, and you even see that like 
that, that, that emotional response. That's what they're trying to get. And you mentioned Clint Eastwood. I'm glad you finally found an actor to your caliber because all you've done is had negative responses about everybody else's acting. We could talk uh, about all sorts of great. No, no, no. Let me get it right. We could talk about all sorts of great situations, right? Like I love that you brought in someone like like Will Ferrell and and and, uh, and Mark Wahlberg, right? For the other guys, like obviously we talk about chemistry. They had great chemistry together, right? You look at again Will Ferrell, right, and John C. Riley, like their chemistries. We'll take it back further, right? Uh, look at, I mean, just the cast of the Ghostbusters from the original Ghostbusters, right? Like, that's a perfect mashup. Like, could you imagine about anybody else playing all those guys? Probably not. Yeah. You know, even finding someone like Ernie Hudson coming in, and his his mixture into it is just is great. Bill Murray has a great comedic timing. Dan Aykroyd has just a beautiful mind for what he's doing in the business and like in that in his scenes. You look at, pull it back a little bit further, Marty McFly, right? Let's talk about like, uh, we'll talk about just the dynamics of Back to the Future, right? Like, you and, come and up. I don't know if, if you know, but there was a different actor that played Martin McFly. Right. So they they are, they were actually weeks into filming, uh, and unfortunately, I forgot the actor's name. He was the. I don't even want to. Uh, oh, man, I forget too. But come Michael, on, man, he, help me out. I can't. Yeah, Michael, look Michael J. Fox. When Michael J. Fox came in, and he just had like this. <laughs> Eric like, Stoltz. I think yeah. that's so Eric Stoltz was the original actor. And I mean, you know, he was I couldn't even imagine like heartbreaking. Like, you know, if I were on set and I was the guy, right? And and I'm two, three, four weeks into filming, and the director comes up and is like, hey man, like you're just you you're just not the right fit for this. Like it hurts. I mean that that's that has to hurt. So like, but obviously, you know, Michael J. Fox came in and um you know jumped Lloyd, in that role just had a, and, and owned yeah. it and like i couldn't imagine like anybody else as marty mcfly exactly um, because that's that's him and so like he, he he owned it and interesting thing about uh back to the future is like apparently he was still doing family ties at the time right um because obviously he was the lead role of alex keaton in family ties so he's still doing that and they went to the producers of family ties and they were like hey we need him for this for this movie. You know, he's agreed to it. If we can block out some time, they said as long as it doesn't in, uh, impact his family ties time. So he would actually do family ties during the day, and that's why a lot of the Back to the Future one scenes were all at night, is because they were forced to do it because he was juggling both schedules. Like amazing to be able to to do that and, and juggle both uh, both sides of that. But yeah, I mean that's that he's chemistry like, of. of together you know yeah who it is. i mean we, I, I can i could put over people all day like it, it doesn't hurt my feelings to be i just like pointing out certain people who are just like you just you just miss like it is what it is uh you yeah. know brandon brandon lee i thought was the perfect role for eric in in the pro which uh, it's my favorite movie right yeah like, i talk what about do you think that. about that uh remake uh, so i haven't uh, seen her at this time Right at this time of recording, I have not seen a remake yet, okay. and I'm I'm very curious to see it because I do. There are aspects of it I do like. There are aspects of it that I don't like before before ever watching the movie. So that's why I want to kind of want to give myself a chance, like to so go that, see it. Yeah, and so that, that has Bill Skarsgård. Yeah, and I I love him as Pennywise, and I loved him as uh oh Jesus, what was his name in Deadpool two, um. He was uh, Rick, uh, uh, Zeitgeist, and I liked him as Zeitgeist. Um, so I'm very curious to see. I wasn't giving you the handout on that. You didn't help me out on the Eric Stoltz one. So yeah, and I, 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 that one. I was gonna get it. I was gonna get that. I was like, I knew, I knew it. I was like, he's got acid. What was the so? But no, I did like him um, as Zeitgeist. So there, there are aspects of him that I do like him in certain movies. But this again, like this is my favorite movie. And if I go in there thinking about like this has to be this, I'm afraid that it's not going to, and it's going to let me down. So I'm like, I want to go in there open-minded and just be like, take me on this ride. Show me what you got, Bill, because I like him and a lot of other stuff. Yeah. I just hope that in my favorite movie of all time, you're going to be like, yeah, oh. I mean, it's a tough one. I mean, you know, when you yeah. go and see a reimagining of it and it, it's, it's, it's gotta be, it's gotta be tough as an actor. Um, and I'm, I'm trying to think like, how could you see something that's so like, kind of that's you know that's the role right like mm -hmm. Branley did that role right and obviously other you know they had other crow variant kind of movies out where other people took it on but like you want to 
honor the role, but like, you know, you always hear like, oh, you, you don't, you don't want to just, you want to put a different twist on it. And it's tough because like, sometimes that's the role that needs to get played in a certain way, but you don't want to just have a carbon copy of the way that they played it. You know, like it, you know, take a look at with what's going on with the, in the Joker world, right? Like, obviously Heath Ledger, hands down, in my opinion, was the Joker, right? No discredit to anybody else. And I think at this point, like, even if you played the Joker, you know, you're Jack Nicholson or um, Jared Leto. Jared Leto or, um, why am I drawing a blank on this one? Phoenix. Uh, Joaquin Phoenix. Yep. Um, you know, obviously, I think they could all probably, hopefully they can agree. I mean, you know, it's got to hurt knowing like this person did set a bar, right? Um, you know, but all of them have put a very unique spin on the Joker. Um, but like, it's got to be tough in certain ways to like, not just go and play it that that way. Like you've seen it that way. And it's, you know, I'm on the fence a lot when they try to say, oh, I want to put a unique twist on it. Oh, you know, sometimes they don't, <laughs> depending on who or what the role is. It's not always the best direction um, right. or when like you are doing like a video game, you know, fan, you know, film or whatever, where they're like, don't want, don't play the video game at all. Um, like, and then you'll see some actors will come out and just, you're like, that's a tough one. That is a tough one. Cause you have such an, you know, inherent fan base on like a video game. Like they know this person being played this way in that game. And then they go and watch the film. That's I think that's where a lot of video game films kind of just the actors kind of miss the mark a little bit. Now, you know, I don't need to mention any because some of them really hit video games, you know, hit it. Some don't. Some were told not to play the video game and they still do. And they draw a lot of elements from that character. But like, you know, you have a, a, a very strong fan base that loved that character for what it is. Like not saying to just replicate it, but don't just disregard it. Because right. then you're going to take tens to hundreds of thousands of people that went in there with much love for something and just will just go, no, like, I, I can't do it. I can't, you know, did right. you see how they played this? Like, you know, they would never do it like this, you know, but like, and, and that's the, that's the thing. It would be like if Marty, you know, if I went and played Marty McFly as a 41 year old man and played him entirely the way I wanted to play him, like, you'd have a lot of pissed off back to the future fans. Right. I'm a huge back to the future fan. I think I actually have uh, on my prop right behind me is my, my prop uh, cabinet. You can see some stuff, but I have, I do have a great sports almanac back there. Um, I think what's crazy too, is that like when it comes to like, you're trying so that's a, that's the thing too like in the wrestling world too, right? We always joke about it, but it's kind of a serious thing. There's six characters that you're going to play. It's just your character, your character, regardless of how how much you want to be different, is always going to be one of six. Right, give me the give me the rundown of the six. So you're going to have like the meat, the we call it the white face, uh, white meat baby face, right? So the ultimate good guy, the guy that's like I'm the good guy, always a good guy. Um, you're going to have your mercy. Is he like the new guy or like no, he's always, a veteran? He's always he's the the fan favorite. Like everybody loves him. He's always okay. going to be the good guy. Essentially, if you were to think about like who he is in the wrestling world, Rey Mysterio is a perfect example. Like every time Rey Mysterio wrestles, you never hear a person boo him because they're okay. always even when he's a bad guy, you he's always he's just he's just that guy, right? Well always, well loved. Him. Yeah, everybody loves him. John Cena, perfect example too. Okay. Right? When he yeah. turned when he became like the good guy, you couldn't even, even if you wanted to tease it, you couldn't do it. Um White meat baby face right there. Uh, then you have your. By the face. way, by the way, I will say, John Cena, phenomenal actor. Yes. Like, I have seen a few wrestling people go into the acting world. Some are great, some are not. Obviously, you know they they get good press presence because of their size, and you know you can do act. But John Cena, amazing. I mean, I, he blew me away in. So many different things I've seen him in, even even in uh, in Peacemaker when he's sitting there just playing the piano and like unbelievable. Anyway, so sorry, yes, yeah, so that that's your quintessential good guy. 
<laughs> yeah, yeah. So this is like ultimate good guy. Then you have like an ultimate bad guy, right? So the guy who's like a giant dick. You have your mercenary character. You always have like your supernatural characters, what they refer to it as, right? So like your Undertakers. Uh, Kane is another person that a, a prime example of that person. Um, I think you're that guy. You always have the the wrestler, the guy that's I'm a really good wrestler. That's who I am, right? And then the last one is always like um like the 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 badass. Right. So in this case, another person that you would always remember as probably being like the most badass would be Batista. Right. Like in wrestling, like he was just always a badass dude. People loved him because he was so cool. Even he's a bad guy. People liked him. People loved him as a good guy. And yeah, I, I think of Batista as like from crossover from wrestling to, to acting like that dude hands down. Like John Cena is great in his comedic stuff and uh, in the roles that he's taken on. The Rock is always going to be like the great action hero. But. Batista just yeah I mean everything you know, he's, he's great as well I mean yeah I mean, it's, it is amazing like and I know he's, he's just lost a whole bunch of weight because he wants to get um more serious roles like yeah you know, was, you know I don't want to say more serious roles but like you know kind of more common person roles right where yeah. you're not just like you're cast for the action movie and he's he's, he's obviously he's committing to it so, man that was a big piece not, not Batista um but you know, for me, like last year, I went on a weight loss journey. I lost uh, ninety pounds last year. Ooh, um, congratulations! Yeah, appreciate it. It's just you know, it, I started the acting stuff much, much larger, and then you know, the thing is, is like I was getting roles, and and it was a tough one. I was getting roles for like large guy, fat guy, big guy, you know, stuff like that. But like, you know, I had less competition, which was nice because um, like you know, they would they would you know, they, there's not many that were just large and acting and you know could you know do well and so like i was getting i had less competition i was going in but i had less auditions that were coming in because there weren't as many for uh, somebody of a con you know of that size so i just kind of i started doing one meal a day intermittent fasting i started running a lot and i lost 90 pounds and then all of a sudden i got new headshots and I was, all these auditions started coming in for like you know kind of just standard type roles where like you know, dad and, you know, military officer, stuff like that. Like things that like were more to my body type at the time, you know, and, and you know, me gaining and losing weight, I'd be willing to do all the time for, for, for role. But like Batiste is doing the same thing. It's like, you know, have you seen a picture of him lately? Yeah. Well, he went from, you know, cause he averaged. So for those who, who don't know, and they've been living under rock, uh, Dave Batista went from weighing 280 down to 240. Um, and he's very strict about his diet, but and uh, he did that M Night Shyamalan movie, and he was actually at three fifteen because they asked him to gain a bunch of a bunch of weight. So he did, and he hated it because even when he started wrestling originally, he, his high, heaviest was three forty. Then he dropped down, and then at his peak part of where he was wrestling, he was at two ninety. Um, and then when he got done with wrestling, he went back into acting, and then he uh, got big to three fifteen, hated it, and got down to two forty. So yeah, he's been on an incredible diet but even if you want to take one person further look at christian bale like there's a man who is committed to the craft of oh, without a doubt gaining weight and putting on weight the dude did the machinist movie and the next film he did was batman i'm like yeah yeah i mean he damn. went from i mean <laughs> and if any of your your listeners and stuff have not google searched christian bale machinist do it i mean he he ate one apple a day and he was absolutely stick and you know bowed. It was, it was un, yeah. unreal how skinny he was for that. But you know that is commitment, and that's that's the level too. Like you know, I hope to get to a point where I can devote all of my time to developing a character, being able to gain, lose weight, like you know, work out for eight hours a day if I need to to get into Marvel shape. You know. Um, you know, in the meantime, right now I'm answering questions during auditions. Uh, would you mind shaving your beard? Absolutely, please give me a reason to. <laughs> I, actually, I I did answer one during an audition. They said, uh, you know, for for a role, would you uh, would you have any issue with shaving your beard? I said, I would shave every hair on my body if you needed me to. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody okay. in the room laughed. Nobody Dang, in the room laughed. I was just like, all right. We're gonna miss on that one. I'm like, well, 
I mean, it is what it is. Your guys don't want to laugh. I bet they laughed afterwards. They didn't say anything, but they were like, hey, yo, that was actually kind of funny that he said that. Uh, he shaved all the hair on his body. Yeah, I just like, I was just like, I'll shave every hair on my body for you guys. I was, just like, I was like, is it for a cheese it, cheese it commercial? I'm in. <laughs> <laughs> do I get do I get free cheese it's Actually, with uh, <laughs> with my son, it was funny. So he was obviously on that. And my, so my son, uh, he's 11 now. He'll be 12 in October. Um, and he, uh, he, aside from the cheesy commercial, he actually did audition last year. Um, I never put it, made it public, but he auditioned last year for Deadpool 3. Hey, yo. And, uh, yeah, he put on a hell of, hell of an audition. It was, it was, he's a, he's a wonderful little actor. Um, but he, he auditioned for it. And unfortunately the role ended up, uh, going to, uh, Ryan Reynolds' daughter. Uh, oh, okay. It was that kid Deadpool. Um, I like it. Yeah, so that it was, it was, but he was, it was phenomenal. But when we did the Cheese It commercial together, um, it was funny because you know this is his first big, real professional gig, and we had a production assistant that would take care of us and you know whatever. Hey, if you need anything, if you need coffee, if you need water, juice, just let me know. I'll take care of it. And so like they would ask him, and you know he's like, he's like, well, well what can I ask? Oh, whatever you want. We'll we'll try to get it. He's like, okay, can I have some Cheez Its? And we're on the set of cheese, <laughs> right? And he's like, "Can I have some cheese?" And they were like, um, "Let me check on that." And they they leave and they come back and they're like, "Unfortunately, not. Um, all of the cheese that we have are part of the prop department because they needed it for the guy sliding down the hill, so he could have the cheese that's flying into his mouth." And so they were like, "They're the only ones that actually have that's just part of props, and we can't give you any." And so. At lunchtime, they're like, "Okay, it's lunch. Do you need anything? You know, you know, we can get you your food. And what do you, what do you want?" My son goes, "Is there any way I could just get some cheese its And they're like, "No, we're sorry. Like they're part of the." And yeah. He asked all damn day, like he just, <laughs> I, and it just became his own like internal joke where he would ask. I think, or he just forgot. I don't know, but like he just continued to ask. He didn't understand why he, he would because there were like pallets of them. Like he literally saw pallets of cheese in, but they were owned by the prop department. And uh, at the end of the day, finally that production assistant came out with a gigantic case of cheese in and just handed it to him. And I have a picture of him. And he's sitting there and he's got this huge case of cheese in, and he's just so happy because he finally got his case of cheese. In. And he went home and shared it with his brothers and, they were eating cheeses for weeks and stuff like that, but uh, <laughs> he, uh, I don't, know. I don't know how I got on that story, but uh, I love it though. I'm here he, for it though. <laughs> here we are. This is this is ADHD. That's what this podcast time. is all about. This pretty much, hey, hey, I've told everybody who comes on the show, I pretty much treat just like the Joe Rogan experience. And so like, it's just of the wrestling world. So wherever these stories go, they usually go. Usually what ends up happening at the end of the show though, I always end up asking questions, which that's where we're headed to. Oh, all right. Here we go. Good because it's it is it is getting late out here in England. You yeah. for accommodating to my schedule a little bit and not. But we're gonna take this to my favorite part of the, the the three count podcast, which is the three count podcast ten count questions. And uh, Mr. O'Donnell, how's it gonna work? I'm gonna fire off ten questions at you rapid fast, and whatever your answer is, that is your answer. All right. So we're gonna put our imaginary timer for added pressure. And in the words of my favorite commentator, Mike Goldberg, here we go. SmackDown or Raw? Raw. That favorite movie? Little Monsters. Willy Apple Wonka. Wonka. Oh, I can't change it. It's all right. It's cool. We like both answers. Uh, Apple. The or original Android. one with Gene Wilder. <laughs> yes, 100%. <laughs> Apple or Android? Android. Favorite cartoon? Ducktails. Let's go. Uh, waffles or pancakes? Pancakes. Favorite TV show? Sliders. Marvel or DC? Marvel. Favorite podcast? Three. He got it. Something got it. three. Three count. Yeah, three count. He got it. The three count podcast. He got it. He got it. He do. <laughs> he do. <laughs> uh, nominate one person that you would like to see on this podcast. Uh, John Cena. Let's go. I'm all about it. But, you know, our fans wouldn't be able to see him. 
Uh, last you question. should just interview nothing. <laughs> I have interviewed. Hey, listen, I have interviewed myself. So, like, that is a that is an episode that's on. Here. Uh, last but not least, my favorite question to ask every single person that comes on this show: favorite curse word. Cunt. And I was like figuring that you're out there. Like that had to be. No, it always has been. It's I don't know why. It's just it's it's that like next weird level of vulgarity that I don't know why. Like <laughs> like it, it, like ultimately like swears themselves are created by our society to just be bad, right? Like we have just chosen words along the way that just we want to just somehow they have just been ingrained in society as being bad and like and so there's obviously tier one swears which like you know even though the f word right fuck like it's supposed to be the limit right it's supposed to be like oh you're allowed one f bomb in a pg-13 movie right but like that's like tier one swear. but for some reason like this one that just pokes out through like it's like when you look at like the national geographic like mushroom blooming in the rainforest and it's like this curse word just ekes out it's just like cunt I don't know why, but like for some reason, it just like it turns people like yeah, and, and it's crazy because it's, it's an American thing. Like it's an American because the listen British people say it's like water, this is everything. So not true. I okay, and, well, then maybe maybe British wrestlers, because... Australians for sure, they love it. Um, <laughs> it's a weird one in in Britain, and I. Uh, I, I, I'm hesitant on telling this story because I don't know if I want it to get out there, but I'll tell it. And I know we got to wrap up, but uh, I'll just quickly. No, I can't. I can't tell it. I okay. Can't. We won't worry I, about it. I, it, 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 was, we'll do. it was a bad mistake using that word in an inappropriate spot in my life. And uh, it ended up involving a, a ban from a restaurant so i'll just leave it at that no all right well then what we'll do is like every great part of a wrestling mat actually no before we do that see yeah the last thing i'm gonna have for you to do is tell our listeners and our viewers know where they can find you oh yeah um well i am on instagram and twitter at one will o'donnell w-i-l-l-o-d-o-n-e-l-l -L -L. so the number one and then will o'donnell on Instagram and Twitter. Um, I appreciate follows. Um, I don't update them as often as I probably should, but I do update it with content when I get it. Um, so you'll see like my show reel up there. Um, I, I'm about to actually announce today. I, I put it on Facebook, but my Facebook is private. But uh, on Instagram and Twitter, I'm about to announce my involvement in a feature film that uh, finally has a release date. Um, November 28th, I filmed uh, a movie last year with James Franco. Um, it's called Hey Joe. Um, so uh, it takes place in, in Italy and in New Jersey. Um, but I, I got to actually work alongside with James Franco in a couple of scenes, which was great because I did, uh, I mean, I, I grew up watching him as, you know, Harry Osborne. And, you know, I, I mean, you know, amazing to then 20 years later be sharing scenes with him and, and riffing off each other, doing some improv uh, in certain scenes and kind of, you know, really kind of having a great time. And so i um, about to announce actually today on Instagram and Twitter. So please follow me on there and you'll see some, uh, you know, announcements. Uh, you know, this that movie's coming out on November 28th. Um, I don't know what the release looks like, whether it's worldwide or regional at first, but uh, yeah, uh, but please follow me and I'll update with things as I as I do. I don't update social media as often as I probably should. Hopefully I get to a point in my career where I can have a social media manager. <laughs> that, well, he told you where you can find him. He even told you about his new movie that's coming out. So you guys make sure go check out Hey Joe when it comes out November 28th. And then, you know what that means? Like every great part of a wrestling match. We got to take this home because this is the Three Count Podcast presents Now Entering, and I'm your host, Clifford Red Dog Miller, the man that leads you up that mountain called wrestling. And like, you know, every good show, you got to have someone who's been there, done that, and can be more and do it more efficient than you can. So I said, about me. It's about who's into the ring. So who's into the ring? You see that man right there. Will O'Donnell, you guys know what to do. Tune in to the next episode and be there 
or you're legitimately subscribed to our YouTube channel, you're following us on all of our social media platforms, you're listening to us on Spotify, you're even checking us out on Amazon Music, and you're even checking us out on that dumb app with the stupid jingle that goes, iHeartRadio, whatever it is. You're checking us, you're buying our merch on ProWrestlingTees.com, you're even checking us out on ForYourWear.com and buying our merch there. You're telling your mom about it, your dad about it, your aunties, your uncles, your brothers, your sisters, your cousins, your best friends, and your enemies because we love haters too. You're doing all that stuff, or really you're just waiting for this episode to end, you're waiting for that outro. And then you're choosing another episode to listen to. Which Kawaii. What's going on? It is Clipper Red Dog Miller, the man that needs you up your nose and call wrestling. And what we need from you guys is to kind of show some support, right? We want you guys to go to our YouTube channel at the Three Count Podcast, go on to our Twitch channel, Three Count Pod, or even our Facebook page, Three Count Podcast, and just give us a like, follow, subscribe, even give us a comment, right? Do all that cool stuff. Share it with your friends, share it with your family, share it with your enemies, right? Or you can even come talk to us and just chat us up, right? Find us on Twitter at Three Count underscore Pod. Find us on IG and on TikTok at Three Count Pod. Go ahead and leave us those comments. We want to hear from all of you guys. We're going to keep putting on videos and stuff like that. We want to keep making this content better. So we want your guys' support. Also, if you guys want to, go support us at ProWrestlingTees.com forward slash the 3Count Podcast or even find us on ForYourWear.com. Give us the support. Show us your guys' love because we want to give it right back to y'all. So in the meantime, in the meantime, love y'all.